night. Um, so we have established a quorum. We have all but one uh, of, of, of my colleagues here. Um, if I could get Ms. Slicely Woodard to lead us in the pledge, that would be great. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So we're going to proceed with the new um, feature on our um, agenda called 30 Seconds in My District, and I'll call on my colleague, Dr. Um, yeah. Brent. With great joy, uh, we will be experiencing a progress party tomorrow morning at Overton uh, High School. Uh, we will take a tour and oh. uh, view all of the renovations that have taken place. So we're very excited. Very good. It's fun. Okay, I have two. I have two events that happen, but I'm going to try to comply with the 30 seconds, so I'm going to save one <laughs> save one for next time. Um, uh, Friday, we had a great event at H.G. Hill Middle School um, where my family, we took my family, and uh, it was called Friday Night Lights, the first time they've had this event. <laughs> Huge fun. Over 500 people showed up. Um, there was hula hooping, and uh, um, we had a parent DJ, Chick-fil-A's, Kona ice truck. That was a big hit. Um, and a dunking booth uh, for the teachers. Bless their hearts. The teachers went in that cold water <laughs> repeatedly. But anyways, huge, big fun, big community building event. And I, I want to thank everybody that made that possible. The kids had a blast. Thank you. Mr. Pinkson. Thank you. On Sunday, I had uh, the opportunity to have a dad-daughter date oh. uh, to see uh, Aladdin, the musical, at uh, Wright Middle School. And I uh, just want to say that Wright Middle School, which is in the Glencliff Cluster, uh, they do a great job uh, with performing arts. They are one of two uh, middle schools in Tennessee that were chosen by Disney Musicals and Schools and TPAC to produce a uh, uh, Disney musicals, which they've done over the last couple of years. Congratulations to Josh Binkley, the director um, of, the, uh, of, of the production, and then also uh, especially to the cast and crew, including Quentin Carter, uh, who played the role of Aladdin, uh, Shamso Hussein, who played the role of the genie, and Tabitha Abera, Jasmine. So they did uh, great work. They're destined for Broadway. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That's fair. Thank you. Uh, this week, the Boys and Girls Club donated $1,500 to the reading clinics. And um, I'm, I'm really excited about that. The reading clinics are part of our work with our comprehensive literacy plan, and where we utilize volunteers. And we, uh, we have 100, uh, 800 volunteers from across the district. And those volunteers are trained by Angela Mosley and Tammy Lipsy. And so I want to say congratulations to, to them on their work with the reading clinics, and we're excited to have uh, that donation. Thank you. Ms. Hunter. Yes, over the weekend, um, Southeast Nashville hosted the Southeast um, Extravaganza, and we there were approximately 5,000 children, families. Um, Dr. Joseph also attended, and also my fellow colleague, Will Pinkston. Cito Narcisse came out. The mayor was there and various other community um, servants and constituents. So um, it was wonderful, and uh, if any of you attended, thank you for coming out. Ms. Pierce. Okay, I might go over 30 seconds, but um, Percy Priest Elementary School had has a finalist in the Belmont's annual poetry contract, contest. So Oliver Jackson's poem, My Lucky Day, was selected among the top five of 124 total submissions, and I'm going to read it. So it is <laughs> hilarious. A hungry fox was at home preparing for dinner when he heard a pig knock at the door and thought, I must be a winner. The fox said he would eat him and put him in a pan, but that wasn't in the smart little piglet's plan. The filthy little piglet kicked and squealed. The fox was only thinking of his next meal. The piglet suggested the fox clean him before the fox crams him into the oven drawer. The fox led the pig on a path to the bath, and he scrubbed him so clean that he was the cleanest piglet he'd ever seen. Then the piglet said, wait, don't you want to make me fat as can be? And the fox thought, sure, you'd be the best bee on a BLT. The fox was ready for the pig to surrender, but the pig said, don't 
you want me to be tender? The fox worked so hard that he fell to the ground and was passed out and didn't make a sound. Then the cleanest, fattest, and softest pig ran away and said, this must be my lucky day. <laughs> Bugs. Um, I'm going to try to touch at least three of the four corners of my district. Um, Inglewood Elementary School, Rosebank Elementary School, Dan Mills Elementary School, who is not directly in my district, but whose uh, families I serve a lot of, and Lachlan Ele Elementary School have all hosted family meetings either this week or last week, and I'm just really excited that they engage the community so much and so often. Um, I also had a budget meeting at STEM Prep, and the families, the, the students that were there, the questions that were asked, the discussions that were had, um, just was really insightful, and I was just glad to be able to touch people in that way. And then uh, Dr. Joseph and I were were able to visit Park Avenue Elementary School and see all the wonderful things happening out there and just see all the different ways that we can continue to support that community and that school and see the growth that we, we know we can see. So thank you. Thank you. Well, my, my 30 seconds is I got in the mail, a picture's worth a thousand words, all these sweet thank you <laughs> notes. I read the book Purple Socks. Everybody knows I love the color purple. So I read the book Purple Socks to the, um, the Spallones class at Tulip Grove, and they sent me these beautiful little thank you notes that I will always treasure. All right, so we'll move along to awards and recognitions. Dr. Joseph. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first recognition is the U.S. Attorney's Office's Excellence in Public Service Award. Uh, each year, the U.S. Attorney General's Office recognizes exceptional law enforcement officers and agents in Middle Tennessee. One of the office's annual recognitions is the Excellence in Public Service Award. Past recipients have included the Sheriff of Davidson County. Now our own Miss Megan McGuire, Community Achieve Site Manager at Buena Vista Elementary School, has received this prestigious honor. Uh, Megan was selected for this highly coveted award for her tireless commitment to the students, families, and staff at Buena Vista and for her leadership in coordinating and aligning the needs of her school community with outstanding community partners. Please join me in recognizing Megan for her outstanding efforts on behalf of the students and families of Metro Schools. Next, we have the TMEA Outstanding Administrator Award. Each year, the Tennessee Music Education Association selects an outstanding administrator who has worked to advance music education and the arts. We are thrilled that one of our own school leaders has been chosen for this prestigious award, Dr. Tanya Williams, Executive Principal at Head Middle Magnet Prep. Dr. Williams has served as the Executive Principal at the school for the past four years. This award acknowledges her endless hours spent supporting music education at Head Middle Magnet Prep. Congratulations to Dr. Williams on this prestigious professional achievement. Um, I'm, I'm proud to... I'm proud to add this recognition to the list of arts-related accomplishments of this district. Uh, Metro Schools has provided outstanding opportunities for youngsters in the arts at all grade levels as part of the strategic plan's focus on visiting middle schools. We'll continue to strengthen our arts education and infuse the arts in middle school grades. Uh, I know as we move forward with this re-envisioning re process that we'll tap the expertise of Dr. Williams and others for their insight and guidance. Once again, congratulations, Dr. Williams.
So our district has so many outstanding employees, and most of them will never receive any formal recognition uh, for their consistent care and service to the children of Metro Schools. Tonight, we honor one of those unsung heroes, uh, Ms. Barbara Ewing, who serves as one of our dedicated bus monitors. We can applause, that's all right. <laughs> Barbara has the distinction of having perfect attendance on the job for the past 10 years. Wow. Her attendance is exemplary. Her supervisors and coworkers say that she's a very special person with a big heart who loves children and is positive and inspiring as an employee. Because of her great attitude and smiles, uh, she makes the workplace warm, welcoming, and friendly. Barbara is intentional every day. That's one of our key objectives in our strategic plan as well. We want to make sure everyone, every employee is like Barbara, focused on the right things and actively working to make the workplace supportive and welcoming for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost there. <laughs> you might think. Uh, <laughs> you might think that someone with a perfect attendance is a workaholic or one dimensional. <laughs> But that's not Barbara. <laughs> She's also a dedicated single mom who cares for her daughter with cerebral palsy. Uh, she also cares for her mother in Franklin, Tennessee, who's been diagnosed with cancer, and she's actively involved with her three grandchildren. Barbara, thank you so much uh, for being a light to so many people in the Metro National Public Schools and for the love and care that you extend to all those around you each and every day. We're so glad to have you as a part of the Metro family, and let's give her another round of applause. Barbara. One of the highlights of our academic year is the honoring of the district's most outstanding teacher through the Teacher of the Year celebration. Today, it is my privilege to introduce our district's finalists for the Middle Tennessee of the Year for, Mid for the Mid-Cumberland region, uh, Ms. Cecily Woodard, uh, who's an eighth grade teacher at West End Middle Prep. Uh, Ms. Woodard is one of 27 regional middle school teacher finalists in the, mid the Mid Cumberland region for grades five through eight. Now she's competing to be chosen as one of the nine regional level teachers of the year for Tennessee. If Ms. Woodard is selected as one of the nine regional teachers of the year, she will receive or she will serve on a special teacher advisory council for Education Commissioner Candace McQueen. Uh, the state's teacher of the year will be chosen from among these nine regional winners. So if Ms. Woodard looks familiar to you, she should. Uh, we, fe we featured her yesterday on a video vignette about the investment that Metro schools will be making in our people to achieve our ambitious goals of a three-year strategic plan. Part of that investment is in our people and leveraging their talents and supporting them with appropriate professional development so they can provide the best instruction possible for every student every day. Uh, Ms. Woodard is a front runner in math instruction and has led many workshops about professional learning opportunities. We're so fortunate to have her and her passion and her expertise here in Metro Schools. Ms. Woodard, Ms. Woodard's most recent honor as a Mid-Cumberland Regional Middle Teacher of the Year finalist is among the long list of recognitions that affirm her skills as an exemplary teacher. 
She is a past Metro Schools Blue Ribbon teacher, a Piedmont Gas STEM superstar, and a Teacher of the Year for West End Middle School, among other honors. As we look forward to re-envisioning middle schools as part of our strategic plan, and as we explore how to expand the integration of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math into our middle schools, we'll definitely be tapping her expertise. Congratulations on yet another prestigious honor, Ms. Woodard. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you for your joy. It's infectious, and thank you for inspiring us all. Okay, and finally, we are fortunate in Nashville to have a vibrant arts community. Our schools provide many unique learning opportunities for youngsters who are gifted in the arts. Today, we'll be hearing all about the band program at Hunters Lane High School, which has grown by nearly 500% in the last four years. Part of the program's success stems from the school's focus on teaching students many of the social emotional skills that we hope to infuse across the district throughout our strategic planning efforts. Hunters Lane is teaching students about the importance of personal character and dedication, and they're using music to build growth mindsets in their students. This is another strategic plan principle. We want our students to develop the confidence and grit to overcome obstacles and to continue to persevere because we know that perseverance and determination are essential uh, for making any dream a reality. And the youngsters at Hunters Lane are clearly on the path to success in college and beyond. This program has garnered the attention of music directors at some of the nation's most renowned historically black colleges and universities, including Concadia College in Selma and Miles College in Fairfield, Alabama. In fact, music directors from these fine universities have offered full scholarships to Hunters Lane graduates to continue their music education. Please welcome Dr. Susan Kessler, principal of Hunters Lane High School, and Mr. Brooks, the school's band director. Did you want to say something? Yeah. You can say something first and then, yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I have been principal of Hunter's Lane for nine years. However, um, what Mr. Brooks did when he came to Hunter's Lane four years ago as a first year teacher was he immediately said, it doesn't matter where we've been, it's all about where we're going. And it's a huge testament to not only his talent, but to the talent that all educators have, that when they can get kids to buy into what they're doing in their program, that it will return tenfold. Um, and we even as recently as today had the band director from Talladega University offer students even more scholarships. And so, you know, the really important people in our district are the ones that are the closest to the children. And Mr. Brooks completely and totally exemplifies that when you have great teachers, you have everything. So Mr. Brooks. I'm just very grateful for the, uh, the opportunity to be here. Uh, I don't look at my job as a job. I don't get up and go and punch a clock. I get up and go do what God has for me to do. I'm. Yeah, thank you. 
<laughs> I'm uh, absolutely grateful for my position. I'm grateful for the support that I have from uh, fans, family, uh, friends, family, the district, and I'm just looking forward to continuing serving these kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Okay, that concludes awards and recognitions. This, this, is, this part of our agenda keeps on growing, and that's a great thing. I love that. Um, and so now we will move on to public participation. As you see your, your name appear on the screen, please line up over here on the side. You will have three minutes to state um, what you want to state. And then at, at the end of three minutes, please relinquish the floor for the next speaker behind you. Uh, so the first person that we have is Nedra Clem, uh, Clem Jackson, then Samantha Eagle, Ash Ashley Lofties, Danielle Norton, and Lakeith Washam. Good evening to the Metro School District, Dr. Sean Joseph, Board Chairwoman Anna Shepard, and Board Chair Member Ms. Christine Buzz, who is instrumental in getting me this three minutes to talk before you today. And ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Nedra Clem Jackson. I'm a funded physician. And it's going to be hard to just talk three minutes about this issue. My office is in Brentwood, Tennessee. And today I'm here as chair of the national chapter of the Citizen Commission of Human Rights and see how I, as a family physician, and my consultants can help Nashville Metro School District with a growing epidemic, students being put on Adderall. Most of the time, it is not medically indicated. Now, I'm, I'm, I have water because one of the hazards of being a doctor, family physician, is pollen, and one of my patients got me sick, so I've been recovering since Thursday. Uh -oh. But what is the Citizens Commission on Human Rights? It is a mental health watchdog working with physicians as myself, scientists, nurses, psychologists, companies, we're a nonprofit organization. Sometimes, I hate to say this, but I've seen patients on Adderall when it's not indicated, when a parent feels the child needs it or a teacher tells the child you need to be put on Adderall because of behavior issues in the school or home. But first, a child needs to be tested by a physician. Why many doctors do not recommend Adderall? Yes, some patients do need it, but the side effects, heart problems, this can lead to more controlled substance abuse. Some kids can get on harsher drugs, such as Lortab. As we know, Tennessee is number two in state in the country of narcotic abuse. It can lead to depression, anxiety, and even suicide. So, what am I recommending, and what has my organization done since I've been chair? We attended Perrin University, and we passed our literature. I have two staff members, two executive directors who have spoke to you before. <laughs> We've been on a legislative plaza to make lawmakers aware of this every week, either Wednesday or Tuesday, and we have presented CDs to all the principals uh, so far. We will also be reaching out to Williamson School District because this is a problem, elementary through high school. It's a problem throughout the country. It's a problem in Middle Tennessee. What are my recommendations? To help my organization be more accessible to your schools. Get more kids if they're not on Medicaid. And we're not saying that it's not an issue of race, ethnicity, or what insurance. These are kids that I see who family may have income 
a six-figure income. It is a growing epidemic. But those kids who are eligible for Medicaid can be seen by me, and Medicaid will pay for this. With Medicaid, if a person does not have transportation, Medicaid will provide transportation to my office. Thank you, also, Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much, and I do hope that I do hear from you, and thank you, Ms. Christine Buzz. Hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you. Ms. Eagle. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Samantha Eagle, but I'm not here to talk to you about anything medical tonight. I'm here to talk to you on behalf um, of my children as a parent. Um, I have three little boys. The oldest is now a kindergartner at Lachlan Elementary School, um, but last year he was fortunate enough to be at Ross, and we have our other child uh, registered, hopefully also to be at Ross next year, and we had a great experience. And part of that was um, our amazing experience with Plant the Seed. Um, it is an amazing organization. Um, my oldest child has a sensory processing disorder and for a child who has a really hard time functioning all day in a normal classroom and who has a really hard time talking to us about that and relating to other people and uh, really kind of feeling like he fits in in the school day, what Plant the Seed did for him last year was give him an outlet for that. It gave him something to connect to, something to feel passionate about. Um, what it taught him not only about growing things in the, uh, in the soil, but also just being part of a community and doing something with his class and feeling engaged and feeling like someone was doing something that he cared about about. Um, it was really phenomenal. It's one of the only things that he would ever talk about. We would get home every day, kind of try to engage him and how was his day and what did he do and how did he spend his time and you could get almost no information. Um, but on his plant the seed days, it was Thursday and it was one of the only days where he came home and had something to tell me about his day. And, you know, it was in his own way and, you know, but it would usually involve something about, you know, we tried radishes today. Mommy, I planted those. Like, mommy, those are the seeds I put in the ground. You know, mommy, we tried, you know, um, to tomatoes today, whatever it was, he just, it was so important to him and not only kind of, and not even to him, but just kind of even to our whole family because he would come home and say, I tried radishes. Colston, who's his little brother, like, have you ever tried radishes? Let's get radishes. And for a three-year-old who doesn't eat anything, um, you know, what Plant the Seed did for him, who wasn't even a student yet, um, was really amazing too. And he already talks about kind of what, um, what, you know, is he going to get to do Plant the Seed next year and what is he going to grow and can we do a garden at our house? and kind of, so just there were so many benefits from where does healthy food come from? How does food get here? Where does, where does it grow? What's involved in that? How do you take care of something? How do you nurture something? How do you watch it grow? And kind of watching plant the seed grow in my own family and in my own life last year was really amazing. And uh, honestly, when we were trying to decide uh, where to, where was going to be the best place for kindergarten for him? That was one of the questions that we had um, and we're uh, very sad that he wasn't available at Lachlan and that gardening isn't something that he'll get to do again at school until he's in the fourth grade. So um, thinking that it potentially is something that could be reduced or eliminated from some of our schools um, is, is really sad to me, really, is there's no other way to say it. Um, and just kind of thinking about the impact that it had. Yes, my child will find out where food comes from and we can do gardens at home and we can do all of those things at home, but um, there's a lot of families that aren't able to engage in that way and even for families who can having the opportunity to have that as a stepping point for the school uh, through the school and for home is really amazing so that's my three minutes thank you but. Ms. Ange Ashley Lofties Ashley Lofties not here okay uh, Danielle Norton Hi, actually, I'm not Danielle. Um, my name is Lisa. I'm subbing for Danielle. So my name is Lisa Mangrome. My daughter is Amari Mangrone, and she is in first grade at Rosebank Elementary School. But um, I am here to talk about her experiences at Ross Early Learning Center and with the program Plant the Seed. Um, when she attended Ross, it was the first year that the program um, using the, um, I call them pre-K hubs, um, I think you call them early learning centers, um, had started and Plant the Seed was started right in with it and it made such a difference to the overall feel of the school every day. I've been in a lot of schools as a substitute, as a parent, um, as a teacher, and I have never been in an environment that was so dynamically involved with the children being um, you, the children using so much applied hands-on learning and active learning in such a way that was so engaging to them. 
they really, she would come home every day that she had did something with plant the seed, just brimming with excitement. Couldn't wait to tell me what she'd done that day whether it was making a bird feeder out of an orange and then figuring out where was the best place in the garden to put it, or it was digging um, up soil and planting a raspberry bush. She was just thrilled to tell me all about it. And we do garden at home, and we do a lot of stuff at home. Doesn't matter. She was thrilled every time she did something with plant the seed. Um, and the amount of time that the children get outdoors, whether they're making mud pies in the outdoor kitchen or they're... Um, observing caterpillars or watching worms and learning about what interactions they make in the garden, that time outdoors and that active learning is so important to the kids. We all know that there's lots of research about integrated learning, um, which Plant the Seeds supports in so many ways. They support the curriculum in these schools, whether it's the clothes making cycle or the production of fabric and then the production of clothes. They integrate with that using dyes and fabrics and making those dyes from the plants they grow um, and talking about how the plants become cotton. Um, so integrated learning we know from a lot of the research that's out there, the outdoor learning, integrated learning, applied hands-on learning, things where families can be involved. Families were always invited to be in par a part of the learning and the um, instruction and the building of the gardens at Ross. and so. I think that the strength in that program is very evident in what the kids experience and their excitement around it and the amount of time that they get doing all of those different kinds of activities. And I would really encourage you to continue the program. I'd love to see it in every grade level, but I, I, you know, I was asking my daughter about it on the way here, and she was like, oh, that would be awesome. She, like, it's been two years, and she still would love to have plant the seed at the school she's at now. So, um, again, I just encourage you to continue the funding and support that program. Thank, Thank you. you. Lakeith Washam, James and Lisa Jones, Patrice Gentry, Lolita Kennard, and Dijon Croft. Hey, my name is James Jones. I'm a, uh, a lead middle, middle school parent, and I'm here to support the high school that they're, they're trying to open up. Uh, Ever since she started, ever since my daughter started Lead Academy, that uh, she has uh, actually enjoyed start starting to enjoy going to school and and uh, really enjoying the activities and stuff that they have, and it's actually progressed her to do more with the school, to open up and enjoy school and and stuff like that. And I just want to see the that progress keep going. I mean, they've got. They have a better, uh, 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 a good plan that we see would be good for our daughter, and that's uh, while we're here, we'd like to see them be able to progress into the high school also, and not just the middle school, and then have to ch uh, sh put her in a different uh, environment, uh, you know, starting a different kind of curriculum in a different school. We'd, that would like to see her progress into the uh, Lead Academy uh, High School. Uh, and uh, that's <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Patrice Gentry? Hi, my name is Patrice Gentry. I'm a neatly being parent. I'm here tonight to talk about the school and ask for your support for the LEAD Academy North High School that LEAD wants to run. I'm also here to ask you to, to continue to support our college uh, prep middle school. The reason why I like this school is because my daughter loves the school. And when she first started the school, um, she thought it was so hard she didn't want to go. But each time and each month went by, she realized that it was getting easier and easier. And so she said, I could do it. So now when she comes home from school, um, the first thing she do is put her books down, get her homework, and no questions asked. And she also said that if we could just go to the 12th grade, she said, really don't want to change school. If we can just go on, she said, I don't like to change schools. She changed schools from one school to another. 
And I, I'm very pleased with the school. Um, and I would like for you all to continue to think about um, us having the high school um, and keeping the middle school open for other kids as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lillard? Good evening, Dr. Joseph and board members. I come to you today on behalf of my fellow secretary bookkeepers, the MPS family that we are. My name is Lolita Kennard, and I've worked at, uh, with MB MNPS for 31 years. Those 31 years, I have been, thank you. Those 31 years, I have worked at Percy Priest Elementary School. That is the only school that I've worked um, as secretary bookkeeper, the only position. I love my job, my school, my family, my staff, but most of all, I love my kids. I have devoted half of my life to the MNPS family, and I'm very proud of my work history. I want to share with you briefly some of our concerns over the handling of the secretary bookkeepers these past few weeks. We were told since our job was being reclassified, we would need to reapply for our current positions, and that reapplying would include an interview panel, test, and interview with our principal. All secretary bookkeepers took the same test whether it was their first year or their 31st year. Many of us have been doing our jobs for years at the current rate of pay, and each year as new duties were added, we continued to do the work that was ex expected of us because we love our job and our school family, even though we were underpaid. This year, when it finally appeared that folks realized that we should be fairly compensated, it was decided that in order to determine if we were worthy of the pay increase, we would have to prove it. I ask, isn't our work history evidence enough? We all get annual evaluations from our principal who sees our work in action on a daily basis. Now, if we're not up to the work, wouldn't those evaluations have shown it? If they don't, then do we need to put more in depth and training to do our job? Perhaps the evaluation process needs to be revamped. I ask this respectfully because I speak on behalf of many dedicated secretary bookkeepers who felt very disrespected and disenfranchised by these past few weeks. We were specifically told that there would be basic computer skills, including the ability to understand Word and Excel on the test. <laughs> I took that seriously and reviewed those programs from the resource links that they provided for us, as many others did before the test time. There were 78 questions, 12 pages, and a two-hour test. No computers. Questions about computers on the test. I was ready. There are still many more questions that we have about the process, and we ask that you please work with our union, the SEIU, and thoughtfully approach these changes as they are rolled out, because this process has been a drain on everybody, and I know it has them, and the resources both within our schools and here at the board. I thank you for your time and your ears. Thank you. Dejean Croft, Shalita Allen. Good evening, my name is Shalita Allen. I'm just gonna kind of piggyback a little bit on what um, Ms. Uh, Kennard was um, speaking about. The process itself was kind of strenuous. Um, I just thought maybe the process could have been something more. Um, we are 12 month employees, that maybe that'd be a process that you have done over the summer. 
I just know uh, myself being a first year secretary bookkeeper, it was really stressful for me to try to complete my job um, successfully and think about the testing process, um, having to be reevaluated um, on some of the things that I've just newly learned. So I'm still, you know, learning, um, going through the process, making mistakes, correcting them um, to be tested again on some of the stuff that I, you know, just, you know, learned. Um, I just felt like we should, we could have been tested over the summertime because we are 12 months that it does give you two months to kind of get us all together because the process as it's just coming to an end has been almost two months. So that could have been a, something we could have done over the summer where it doesn't interrupt us, um, I guess mentally, mental drain on us as bookkeepers because we do take on a lot. Like I said, this year they do have two roles, secretary bookkeeper, being in the front office all day long, having to deal with um, taking temperatures and doing other things. And I think that was one of the reasons why um, you guys had decided to reevaluate that position because of us having so much on us. And um, I'm, I'm grateful for that so that we are able to do more bookkeeping. But I take it in another note to, you know, be mindful that, you know, it could have been handled, I guess, a, a, a different way, you know, not put more stress on us than we already have. And so I just ask that, you know, next time we think about reevaluating a job, that we think about some of the responsibilities and things that some of the others are having to do already before we put more on us, because we do do our best. And I do love my job. Um, I subbed um, and sub, sub for oh, since 02. And I just got the permanent position. And I do have kids in metro schools. Um, I actually have seven. So um, like I said, I am very familiar with uh, metro schools. And um, I love having my kids here in metro schools. And I love working for metro. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brad Rayson. Good evening. I'm Brad Rayson. I'm president of SEIU Local 205. Um, both Shalita and, and Lolita have spoken eloquently to our concerns. You know, first I want to say we're not against the creation of this new job. Uh, we support any chance that any opportunity where we can improve school operations. But we do have a lot of concerns about how this process is being implemented and what the impact is on our members. Um, many, like Lolita, are veteran. Uh, employees, others like Shalita are just getting started, but all of them take on duties far beyond what's on their job description. And they do it willingly. And they thought, you know, someday our pay is going to catch up with the work we do. And they thought this, this is the time, this is the year. We heard there's going to be a pay increase, but nope, wasn't going to be quite that way. Instead of being promoted, they've got to apply for their job again. They're told they're going to have to be interviewed, then they're going to be tested, then they're going to be interviewed again. Uh, this led to a lot of confusion, apprehension, and concerns among our members. Questions like, why are we having to apply for our own job? Are they trying to get rid of us? Why not just train us if there's new things we need to know? What am I going to be asked in these interviews? And what's going to be on this test? Uh, to ease their, their worries, we asked HR for some information about the interviews and the test, and sadly we weren't given that information, which we think would have been helpful. But as you heard, you know, the process has been a little bumpy, um, and as we go further along, there's still a lot of confusion and uncertainty as to when our decision is going to be made. And as Ms. Bugs asked uh, early at the outset of the meeting, she's getting questions, and we are too. What's going to happen to me if I don't get this job? Where do I go? Do I go to the pool? The handout that was given to the employee said, if you're not placed by a certain day, you'll be terminated. Not laid off, not put somewhere else, but terminated. And that scared a lot of folks. They deserve better than that. Will, I wish we had Aladdin's lamp and we could rub it and make a wish. But we hope that the end of this process, that the outcome will be that any secretary and secretary bookkeeper who wants to be a financial payroll records administrator gets that chance. 
and that they all continue serving the schools and the students that they care so much about for years to come. Uh, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do. It's right for them. It's right for our schools. This is what we felt the plan should be all along, that the current employees get the training they need and get the opportunity for these new positions. And we hope you agree with uh, that conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. James Brown? Is he not here tonight? James had to keep working installing phones, so he's okay. still on the job. All right, thank you. Cornelia Adams? Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I would also like to say that um, I recognize and appreciate the work of Dr. Joseph and his leadership team. Um, I'm here today because I understand that there is still a large academic achievement gap between certain ethnic and socioeconomic groups in our district. So I stand before you as a parent volunteer of Nashville Rise, a former teacher of MMPS, and I'm currently a teacher now. Um, but I'm standing before you to let you know that Nashville Rise, our parents are here, we're willing and able, and we want to be a part of the conversations that directly impact our children and their future livelihoods. We want to make sure that our voices are heard and that we're offered the same opportunities to weigh in on what happens to our children when it comes to the many aspects of their education. Many of the parents that are represented in Nashville Rise have children that have once attended traditional metro schools and now attend charter schools for whatever reason. We also know that the word charter schools is a sensitive topic. However, charter schools is just an option. We're seeking options for our children, and we want our children to have more immediate academic and post-secondary success. Many of us believe that in the past, our socioeconomic status and ethnic affiliations um, have kept us from the conversation and that we're talked at, but we're not seen as valid or important stakeholders in the process that directly impacts our children, the children that are struggling the most. We appreciate the many parent talks that have taken place and your willingness to be transparent with your plans as director of schools. And we are also looking forward to you reaching out to us, your leadership team, so that we can talk. And us as Nashville Rise, we want to have conversations. We form this group so that we can be informed parents about what's going on in the school systems, but we want to have a place. We want to talk about what's working and what's not working, and we want to look at those cultural boundaries that we don't want to talk about. We don't want to face those, and um, we think that that's going to make a great impact on those groups that um, are not performing well, and so we would just want a conversation, and we want you guys to see what we're about, come to our meetings, and involve us in the process. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, okay, so my name is Kelly Aguacoon, and I am uh, with National Rise as well. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about parent engagement and the importance of parent engagement. It, but, and I know that because I'm involved and I have attended parent universities, I use the um, the call center when I need to. I know that you are committed to parent involvement. Um, but the thing is, a lot of what you do is from top down. So you have Parent University, and those are your people that come in, and that's cool and it's good. But what we're talking about is a vertical, I'm sorry, a horizontal relationship, parents reaching out to parents. And that's what Nashville Rise does. Um, I became involved with it because I was confused when it came to one of the elections, and I wanted to hear what the candidates had to say. And I was so glad that I went. I was like on the verge of not going, but I was so glad that I went um, because I got to hear what candidates had to say to me, had to say about what was going on in my district. Because to be honest, I had voted before, and that was like a bust. And I wish I had never voted for that person because, man, they did not do. But thankfully, the person I voted for this time is working out and doing a good job. So 
we do want to invite you to the table at National Rise to see what we have to offer so that we can, can um, make some continuity and establish that horizontal relationship. Because I'm going to listen to another parent before I listen to what a school board member has to say. Or I'm going to listen to another parent quicker than I'm going to listen to a principal. Because I know they're probably talking from the talking points and what is what has to be said. But another parent is going to be honest with me and tell me what needs to be said. I want to thank Christine. I cannot wait to hear the budget. I missed that one because of the storm. But the next one that comes around, I can't wait. Um, so that's what I've got to say. All right, thank you. Thank you. Vivian Smith, LaShonda Hufford. Good evening. My name is LaShondra Hartford and I am a mother of four. My middle daughter is a proud student at Lead Academy at Neely's Bend College Prep in Madison. My youngest is currently attending Neely's Bend Elementary but will be attending Neely's Bend College Prep in the fall. My oldest attended public school from kindergarten through high school and my oldest daughter is currently a student at Hunters Lane High School. So I'm very familiar with both the charter school system and the lead public school system. I'm not here to bash either of them because we all have our preferences and we each have to do what we feel works best for our needs. My experience with the lead has been very positive and I am here in support of our college prep middle school. I ask for your continued support of not only our school, but for the LEAD Academy North High School that is being proposed. Since being with LEAD at Neely Spin, my daughter has excelled more academically, earning all A's on her report card. I have seen such a great change in her. She is proud of her school, excited about going every day, and all the different things that they do in the school. She's already thinking about what college she wants to attend. As a parent, some of the things that I love about the school are the open lines of communication between the school and the parents. So we are aware of events as well as what's going on in the school. I like the non-traditional teaching methods used to keep their attention and motivated to learn. Just recently, my daughter was practicing really hard at memorizing the PI number, P-I, so that she could have a chance to PI, P-I-E, a teacher's face. <laughs> Another thing I like are the positive incentives used to promote the students to achieve excellence. My daughter makes sure I sign her paycheck every week that she earns so that she can purchase something from the store. I like the smaller class settings, which allows more time to work one-on-one -on -one with each student. Lastly, I would like to mention this, which is beneficial not just for me and my family, but for the neighborhood also are the community-based activities held outside of school hours, such as movie nights during the summer months. These are just some of the things that have me on board in supporting our school. Every parent wants the best for their children. Each of us are here because we care and want our voices to be heard and that the best decisions be made. I think the greatest investment that can be made is into our children, not just mine, but every child, regardless of their race, religion or economic background. I love the fact that I have the option to choose. I'm also glad to have a better quality school in my neighborhood, and I would like to see the continuum of care at a high school level. So again, I ask that you continue to support our middle school and Elite Academy North High School. Thank you. Thank you. Well, moving on to governance issues, um, we'll begin with the consent agenda. Uh, Ms. Pierce? Um, item 1E6. Okay. All right. Uh, the consent agenda reads as follows. 1A, approval of minutes 6-30-2015 and 2-28-2017. B, recommended approval of change order number 1 for Overton High School renovations, Beaver Engineering, Inc. C, recommended approval to declare 2.57 acres of Bellevue Middle School as surplus for the purpose of selling to the Metropolitan Nashville Fire Department. D, recommended approval to declare Ewing Park 
as surplus for the purpose of selling to KIPP, recommended through the Capital Needs Committee. E, awarding of purchases and contracts. One, Alignment Nashville. Two, awardee <coughs> from ITB number B17-17 USDA Commodity Processing. Three, Committee for Children. Four, Dell Marketing LP. Five, Panorama Education. And uh, F, approval of special courses for the 2017-2018 school year. Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as read. Can I get a second? <coughs> second. I'll approve, show of hands. Any opposed? Okay, the consent agenda passes as read. Ms. Pierce? Yes, I just didn't know if we could defer that item until the next, until we can maybe discuss it at the work session. I've just have gotten um, questions from teachers and parents, um, as well as other people just wondering about the relationship with Putnam County Schools <coughs> and could we do the training in house? Um, those kinds of those kinds of questions, just to have a little more conversation. I'll defer, Chris. So we, we this isn't time sensitive for this meeting, right? We can defer. Says it's fine. It's just the contract itself is for professional development, as I understand it. Right? Yeah. On the math curriculum, it's 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 a contract amendment. Uh, the original contract began March twenty fifth, two thousand fifteen, and this is uh, all federal funds through the Math and Science Partnership Grant. But uh, Gary's saying it's it's not real time sensitive, so so we can postpone and defer until the next meeting. So we'll discuss it at our work session in a, in a couple of weeks and vote it out at the next business meeting. Ms. Harkey, do we need a motion for that? Why don't you go ahead and do one? Okay, Ms. Pierce. So I move that we defer item one e six until the next business meeting after having discussed it at our agenda on the 25th, April 25th meeting, work session. Okay, all right, good. Second. Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Yeah, well, I didn't get the opportunity to do that. Um, all right, let's moving on to um, number <coughs> two, I recommend approval of 2017-18 fiscal year budget. Ms. Bearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Budget and Finance Committee has met several times over the past month, and we've discussed the operating budget, the nutrition services budget, and the federal programs and grant budget. And today we heard an overview of the three-year uh, proposed budget. Um, and also today in our committee meeting, we voted unanimously to approve the 2017-2018 fiscal year budget. So I bring that recommendation to the board. I move to approve the 2017-2018 fiscal year budget. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Um, we have a motion on the floor to approve the budget as presented earlier in committee meeting. Do we have any discussion? If you don't mind, Madam sure, Chair. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to address a few concerns. I've had a lot of constituents, as I'm sure we all have, reach out to us about uh, different issues. Plant the seed, which was one that was discussed tonight, we did talk about that. Um, we were told that we are front loading that funding to make sure that we have, a, or we front loaded the funding to make sure that we had enough funding for training and professional development and to set up the, uh, the, the gardens and the, the areas around the, the ELCs that needed to support this. We're not phasing it out completely. We're just hoping that it'll be self-sustained throughout the community over the next several years. So over at least the next three years that I'm on the board, I will be having some meetings to discuss that with, um, with community members, so be on the lookout for that. And JTG is one that I, uh, a couple of us have gotten uh, uh, correspondence about. We've, we'll, be, we'll be emailing about that also and hoping that the two schools that have been affected are able to either raise the money or add it to their own budget. And lastly, bookkeepers, we appreciate you. I don't want you to think that we've forgotten about you, and we will be looking to see over the next few years just how we can support you all more. Frida, I'll call you. Well, you want to explain for the viewing audience what JTT means? Jobs for Tennessee graduates. Um, it costs about $17,000 a year, and it's currently at Maplewood and Stratford, and it was previously fully funded by an external source, and this is the first year that Metro is being asked to fund it, but we can't find the funding, so we're hoping that schools can make that self-sustaining. 
If you have any other questions, please, again, feel free to email me. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. Anybody else have any, any comments or questions? All right, we have a motion on the floor. It's been uh, seconded to approve the 2017-18 budget as presented. All in, in favor, show of hands. Anybody opposed? Thank you. Thank you, unanimous. Thank you, Ms. Baring. Uh, moving on to um, items three and four, well, we'll take three first. The student Discipline Appeal, Cambridge High School, Ms. Harkey. Uh, um, okay, so we are uh, here again this week to talk about the Student Discipline Appeals. I'll talk kind of both about them together, both three and four together. Um, hopefully you had a chance to review your packet. Uh, as you recall, I've provided some summaries and basically where we are, we's, we've already had, these were two students that had been expelled from their schools. They have gone through a level one appeal hearing um, and also a level two appeal hearing. The level one is in, in front of a discipline review board and then they went to the level two, continued to the appeal um, and went to a level two, which is before the executive director of uh, discipline. Um, from there, they have the option for a level three. That's where we are right now. So as of now, both of these students have asked to have their discipline case reviewed at 11th level three before the Board of Ed. Uh, the first part of that, um, what, what is before you tonight, is whether or not, uh, basically I'll read the law for you. It's in front of the Board of Education and based upon a review of the record, you may grant or deny a request for a board hearing and you may affirm or overturn the decision of the hearing authority with or without a hearing before the board. So again, tonight, uh, kind of your, I guess, maybe first order of business is to decide whether or not you need some additional information, <coughs> want to have a hearing, want to have um, the, the student and family here to, to say, to answer any questions that you have, or whether or not you're ready to make a decision based on the review of the record. Are there questions? So many. <laughs> um, so let me get this straight. Um, so we can grant or deny a request for a hearing Correct. or affirm or what was the other? Or affirm or overturn the decision of the hearing authority with or without a hearing before the board. Can we modify? Yes, you can. Okay. If if the so again, if you feel like you need some more information, granting hearing is probably the only thing that you need to do tonight. If you think that you have based on the review of the record, if you have enough information to go ahead and make a determination either to affirm or overturn or modify, somehow change what has happened previously, you can go ahead and make that decision tonight without a hearing. So do we need a motion before we do anything? Yes. Um, so we need a motion on the first one before we can discuss it then, right? Uh, on the first discipline appeal from Cambridge, yes. Okay, so. Take um, them separately. Okay. It might ahead. depend on how I vote right. the motion. Um, and I, I just want to clarify that uh, both cases, and in fact, have already been modified through the hearings. Correct. Both of these cases have received modifications, and so now, again, the appeal before the board is, they're asking for a slightly further, different things. A further modification. Any other questions or comments? All right. Anybody want to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to grant a hearing. For the number of Cambridge student? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Anybody want to second. make a second? Okay. All right. Any discussion on that? Any questions? What uh, I do have a question uh, uh, concerning that. What is our time frame on that? Um, the Law does not spell out a very, it doesn't spell out a specific time frame when that would have to happen. I would suggest either on our next board agenda or the first one in May. Um, well, the reason I ask is because on our, our agenda for the, the, the last meeting of this bench is really a work session. It's not a business meeting. So it would really have to be on the first one for May. That's fine. Uh, I will say the hearings are scheduled outside of a board meeting itself. So, um, you know, what, what's the easiest thing to do is right after a board meeting you have it, but it could be the gotcha. same thing where we would have That's it right, right after the I work session. Because again, in general, these are closed. If you grant a hearing, they are usually closed to the public. I will say that the student from Cane Ridge has asked that his meeting be opened. Um, if a hearing is granted, but normally these are closed meetings that occur after board business set at a separate time where there's no other board business to take place. We have them, so if y'all are very between, it's hard to remember that. 
All right. Any, any other discussion? We have a motion on the floor to have a, to grant a hearing for the um, discipline appeal for the student at Cambridge High School. All in favor? We have a second. Oh, we have a second. I thought I seconded. Yeah. Oh, so okay. Can I have a, just one discussion? Okay. Um, right. I I am going to vote against that motion just because I do feel like they have already done several modifications and um, have greatly reduced. The, the initial consequence. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, when, when a student assaults a teacher or staff member, that, that's, uh, that is, deserves some repercussions. And um, uh, I agree with Ms. Pierce that we, this process is set up so that the Discipline Review Board heard um, level one, level two, and level three hearings. Is that right? Oh, well, the level the one three? has already occurred before the Discipline Review Board, level two before the Director of Discipline, and then the level three is here. I, so yes, there has been due process through the level one and level two prior to this. Yes. Um, I would be interested in uh, at the most, modifying the expulsion um, so that the student can begin at the beginning of the school year rather than waiting uh, until, you know, I think it would be a disadvantage for the student to have to wait. I forget the date. Isn't that uh, what it is? 18. It is. Oh, that yeah. is what it is. That's already, yes. That, that was the second modification, okay. so he is being allowed to return oh, in oh, August. August. In August 2017. Okay. I've got and that, that would have been my suggestion, <laughs> but since it's already been done. Yes. Um, however, if it's the will of this board, uh, you know, I, I will be happy to sit through another hearing, but, um, but my, my sense at this point is that we've already been through the due process, and um, so that's, thank you. Any other comments? Questions? Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. I look at every, well, I try to look at every student as if they were my student, and in this situation, since we are still part of the process, is icky as we do feel having to be the judges here. I appreciate that they've gone through this process and I can give a few hours of my time and I just would like to appeal to other board members to consider giving some time to at least hear from their own mouths, both the student, uh, any other witnesses, just to hear all of that on our own time. I do have another question. Uh, has this, this is a special needs student. Is this right? Am I confused with the two students? I, I oh, can we not? I would speak prefer of that? that we okay. we um, okay. not go okay. there at this time. Okay, thank you. So we go through these so far and few between. It's difficult to remember, but I do remember now that I'm thinking about it. The last time we had a student appeal, on paper, it appeared that he deserved the punishment that he got until we sat and listen to him. And um, he was very remorseful. It wasn't anything as serious as striking a teacher, but he, he violated a, a policy at our schools, and he was very remorseful. Um, it, it was a very emotional decision. I, <laughs> it's not something I take lightly. Um, so I think, Dr. Brandon, you were with us at that particular one? <clears throat> so anyway. If we have no more comments or no more questions, then we need to call for a vote. And so the, the motion on the floor is to grant a hearing. All in favor? All opposed? Okay. All right. It passes. So we'll be granting a hearing for that particular student, Ms. Harkey. And then we'll move on to number four then. Let's do. For the, for the East Nashville High School. Same scenario. Um, again, there has already been the level one and level two uh, appeals. Also in this situation, the, there has already been a modification to the um, original request for a calendar year like expulsion. So same okay. options on the tape. Okay. All right, so um, I need a motion to either grant or deny a, a request for a hearing or affirm um, what was decided in the level two. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I move to uphold the decision of the Discipline Review Board. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Yes, I do. 
You can no, you can go ahead because I got a lot. Amy, nope, you go. Ms. Frog, go right ahead. Well, I have a question. I'm not sure that I can ask it. <laughs> I can't ask any details about the the discipline that was um, detailed in the packet. Um, go ahead and ask your question. <coughs> okay. So the and it's about what this was all in the packet. So it's about what the student has requested. So can I state that? Is that safe? <laughs> If, if it's not, then... Um, the way I would... So the request here is a little different. Um, I, I think what I tried to point out in, in my summary is that there have been some requests about things that were not actually related to the event on the date, the specific incident date. You guys are only going to be talking about or reviewing what happened on that specific incident date, and so the expulsion there related there too. So again, I know that they've included a few other things in terms of their request. You're only going to be looking at what occurred on that expulsion date. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I think what they're really asking for is is a, a, an additional modification to the original discipline that was handed down. Okay, so... They're wanting it to be called something different, reducing the code to right. a lower level So that level would be code. only that one issue. We could well, not would consider be what would... any sort of supplemental classes for the student. Um, it's, this, the request was academic compensatory classes. Um, Reduce a learning gap. We cannot consider that. As that a, would not be something before the board. Again, you guys are really okay. looking at whether or not to uphold or overturn the expulsion. Obviously, if you thought something like that was warranted, I would encourage you to speak with discipline office um, to see if that's something that they wanted to pursue. Okay. Any other discussion or questions? Yes. Yes, ma'am. I also want a hearing for this student just because in this 67-page packet, um, there were still a lot of contradictions um, I understand that the the consequence had been re, has been reduced, true, but the issue is still children's lives. So when we talk about um, the certain codes that will be listed on her behavior, that behavior sheet on Infinite Campus and the way that it will be labeled when she starts applying for colleges, I just think we want to consider that because the although this was a fight, she was defending herself. Uh, I saw, you know, we had access to the video. She was hit. She responded, protecting herself. Uh, I know that there are other issues here, but it seems like a lot that happened with this decision is based on other issues that happened either at school or other concerns the principal and possibly assistant principals have with the parents. And I don't, I don't, no, not that I don't know that I want to. I don't want to punish a child because there are issues with parents. I would just be interested in, again, hearing from um, the student, hearing from witnesses, hearing from the police officer or whoever else wants to speak that saw what happened that night and that can give us some context around why the, uh, the consequence for her was so different from the people that hit her. I just think that there is more context that's needed before we continue this business. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bugs, I, I, I had a harder time with this one for some of those same reasons, um, just the, some of the contradictions once I went back and looked at it, and, uh, and just it did seem like there was possibly a personality conflict already going on. So I'm not sure. Okay, the motion on the floor is to uphold the decision of the level two hearing. All in favor, show of hands, please. One, two, three. All opposed. Okay, that motion failed. I make a motion that we allow a hearing for the student as well. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, any discussion on that one? Okay, all in favor of um, granting hearing for um, the student East Nashville High School. Four, okay. And opposed would be the three, okay. So we are having two hearings for both students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harkey. <coughs>
Will these be the same night? Um, I will get, <coughs> if, if, if that's okay with you guys, that will probably be the easiest thing to do. Um, but we can split them up if you want. I can certainly work with David and Cameo in terms of getting it scheduled. That would be great. I mean, because they know better what our agendas look like, and maybe we could put it on a night that's not so chock full. That would be great. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Harkey. Appreciate that. Um, moving on to number five, recommendation to certify dismissal charges for Jacqueline Earls. Dr. Joseph. I'm actually oh. going to stick around and help out with okay. that one, too, and then Hi. I will hand it over to Dr. Joseph. Okay. Um, this is here for a recommendation for termination of a teacher, Ms. Jacqueline Earls. She's a teacher at Cane Ridge uh, Elementary School. Um, and I, at this, what, what is before the board tonight is merely to certify the charges. Um, basically, you have been provided the same information that was given to Ms. Earls, and so tonight it's, it's the first step in a termination process where we come to you and have you certify the charges. This basically means that after reading the notice of charges that was given to Ms. Earls, if, if what, without looking at any facts, but if what is, what it, with, if what is on that paper, if proven true is correct, is that enough to terminate a teacher? And if it is enough to terminate a teacher, if proven true, um, <coughs> we'd ask that you go ahead and certify the charges so that we can move to the next step in the, the discipline or the termination process, which would be giving Ms. Earls an option to request an impartial hearing. Uh, she would go before an impartial hearing officer. She has 30 days to request that. After that hearing, uh, again, she either side could then also appeal back to the Board of Ed and that so again this would be an opportunity for it to come back to you for final review tonight it's a matter of certifying the charges against her and so with that I will ask dr. Joseph to read the letter that was provided to the board um, related to this this case sure dear members of the board uh, I am writing to recommend the dismissal of Jacqueline Earls from employment as a tenured teacher with the Metropolitan National Public Schools pursuant to TCA 49-511 have charged her with unprofessional conduct or conduct unbecoming of a member of the teaching profession which are grounds for her dismissal pursuant Tennessee code uh, annotated code 49-5 511 these terms are specifically defined in Tennessee Code, uh, annotated code 49-5501. Evidence supporting these charges was set forth in my letter to Jacqueline Earls on April 4th, 2017, a copy which is attached. I'm asking you to certify these charges by voting that if proven true, these charges warrant Ms. Earls' dismissal. Should you certify these charges, I will inform Ms. Earl of your action and formally advise her of the right to request a hearing before an impartial hearing officer. At the present time, I'm only asking you to certify the charges. I'm not asking you to weigh evidence either for or against dismissal. I'm merely asking you to vote that the charges, if proven true, warrant dismissal. If Ms. Earls requests a hearing, it will occur at some point in the future. Accordingly, it is my recommendation that Jacqueline Earls be dismissed from employment with the Metro Nashville Public Schools. Thank you. Okay, so I need a motion to certify the charges against um, Ms. Earls. Certify the charges. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? I'm sorry, could I just ask, what exactly does it mean to certify the charges? I know, it, I hear what he just said, but can you? It, it, that there's not a whole lot more to it. It just means that if proven true, you think that this on its face, kind of what's written in this letter, is that enough to terminate a teacher? And again, we're not weighing into the evidence that will be presented at a later time if she requests a hearing, but if what is included on the notice of charges, if that's enough to, to terminate a teacher, that's, we would ask that you certify the charges saying that that is enough. Anybody else? Okay, the motion on the floor is to certify the charges against Ms. Earls. Um, all in favor, raise your hands. Against. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harkey. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to reports, the director reports. Uh, number one is presentation of the draft strategic plan. Thank you. Well, yesterday was a significant day for us as a district. Uh, we unveiled uh, the strategic plan framework and our budget priorities that you've been refining and reviewing as a board for the last few months. Uh, the document that you have in front of you that we're going to be presenting in front of you now. It's coming. 
uh, is a draft of our strategic plan. Uh, you've had the opportunity over the last few months to review each and every element of the plan, but this is the first time that you've seen it as a draft, and it is just a, a draft, as you see. We still don't even have a picture on the front yet. It's still, <laughs> it's still hot coming off the press here, but the content uh, itself is um, what would be in the, the final document. Yes. We're going to work on hot, hot, off, hot off the press. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the strategic plan represents countless hours of work on behalf of this board, staff throughout the district, school leaders, parents, business and community partners, and our dedicated transition team. Uh, we have worked together to fine tune each and every goal, strategy, and high level action item. I'm sure you're as proud as I am of the collective efforts that have brought us this far in such a short period of time. And I'll, I'll go on to say, you know, I have. Um, worked in two other school districts and led the effort to develop an actual uh, strategic plan, and it is a timely, costly proposition, and I really want to thank um, Dr. Carlisle and the communications team and, and the full staff for really uh, leading this effort. It, uh, Lots of, lots of school districts actually just kind of contract it out, and it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to pull a document together if you uh, don't, don't know to do it. And I have not been a part of a process. I mean, the last time, I, the first time I did it, I wrote it at my table by myself and just gave it to the board, and they smiled and said, thank you. <laughs> you know, no, no, no real input. The second time, a little more, a little more engaging, uh, but nothing like the work that you all did. In, in pulling this together. And you really should be proud in, in, in giving the community the opportunity along the way to gather feedback, and you'll see that that, that work is there. You know, our plan is our GPS system. <laughs> uh, all our efforts will focus on our students, our people, our organization, and our community. It will guide everything we do for the next three years, including our resource allocation. So uh, we are committed and enthusiastic, and we're ready to dive in, roll up our sleeves, and make this plan a reality for our students. And with your blessing tonight, we'll actively pursue the resources necessary to achieve, uh, achieve our goals. Uh, I want you and our viewing public to be aware that every element of this plan is available on our website at, uh, at www.mnps.org slash strategic plan. And I think you can click on the link to our website, and Jane is going to come up and walk us through what's on the website for you to see and for our community to see as well. Uh, once the plan is approved, finally approved by the board, the document will be finalized and available online and shared with our internal and external stakeholders. And Dr. Carl is going to walk us through what the, the next phase of our work. Uh, we wanted to put this out, but we still have our metrics and things that we need to lock on before we officially you know, finalize and, and move forward. But this lets everyone see what we're working towards uh, without, the, without the targets and measures, but we'll, we'll get to that. But at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Carlisle, Chief of Staff, and she'll lead this portion of the agenda tonight. Hello, everybody. So um, as you know, yesterday uh, there was, at the State of the Schools address, we handed out a card when people left, uh, and it took them to the website, uh, this graphic you'll see in the strategic plan. But if you go to that website link, I just clicked on it, and then it will go to uh, show you the four goals, uh, as well as the five phases. And the phase, as we've just completed or will complete uh, on the 25th when you actually have a document with a cover on it, uh, will be the 28th, will be the um, phase two. And then immediately we're moving into establishing baseline measures and annual um, targets and then project uh, and annual plans into, and that's in phase three. But if you, um, the, what, the way that the website is set up uh, right now, and again, the communications team has done an incredible job. They pulled this website together very quickly. Uh, and we have basically all the data that was gathered up to the 100-day plan and report and up to through the transition team. So that's all captured under phase one. Uh, and you can see it has the voice sessions. So this, the, a lot of these data um, reports have been on the website, but now it's not under the director's page, it's under the strategic plan. 
Uh, and then uh, what the 100-day report included, the transition team report, all the related data uh, for that report. And then if, if going to phase two, this is basically the strategic planning framework which you have laid out in the document uh, in front of you. Uh, you, you can click on the vision, mission, um, and values, and it actually takes you to a new page, but you'll see the vision, the mission, and the values all spelled out there. Um, and then if, so we would go back to this particular page, and we can look at uh, the survey results associated with the vision, mission, and core values that we sent out. So what did the survey results show us? And then um, how we, it doesn't show how we updated it, but it does show that we asked and what the public feedback was. Uh, and then it goes into the characteristics, which you have seen and um, spoken to us about the student characteristics as well as the school characteristics. Again, these are hi highlighted and featured in the report that you have in front of you. Uh, the survey that people responded to uh, to provide us with uh, some feedback on that, and then the, the example that you have in front of you and that we have on the website is, are the final versions of the characteristics as well as the mission, vision, and values. And those represent the foundational elements of the strategic plan framework. And then you can click on each goal. And each goal shows you the goal statement and the strategies related to each of the goal statements. And there's uh, some navigation uh, over to the left when you go through the goals. And you can go to the, our, our people uh, and, and as well as our organization. And all of the detail is featured there for people to uh, and as we move forward with the document that you have in front of you, uh, and again, so this is a, there's narrative. In, what, what differs from the website, for example, is there's a letter from, um, you, you see there's a table of contents. There's a letter from um, Ms. Shepard and Dr. Joseph. There uh, is a profile that, that features data on the district uh, and points of pride as well as opportunities for us to focus on. There's an, an so there's narrative, there's an executive summary, uh, there's how we define the phases uh, with great description uh, and then some additional data and then the core elements. And so then you go into the, the goal statements, the characteristics, or excuse me, the characteristics, the goal statements, the theory of action, uh, and then also uh, the detail associated with each of those four goals and the high-level actions associated with those. And then to, to reiterate, when we talk about the phases, the next uh, phase that we're actually starting Monday, uh, or we've started today, uh, is to look at what are the baseline measures and the annual project planning. And we, we have, uh, we're not stopping with planning, uh, but we are, uh, we do have what I would call a wrap on the strategic framework. You voted on all the elements. Uh, and then uh, we'll come back and Dr. Joseph will seek your approval uh, and, and then there'll be plenty of opportunities to weigh in once we have the baseline measures on the annual targets and how that feeds into our ability to report publicly as well as into uh, evaluations of, of Dr. Joseph and our progress. Any questions, anybody? I have one. Um, not surprisingly, I wasn't given that other little card when I left yesterday. Yeah, that one right you there. Might have got, I went out the back door and I didn't get one either, but I'm happy to give you this one. So um, does it ask for um, any input? No, from because we've, okay. got, we've gotten him. That's what I thought. <laughs> no, okay. No, but we will. I mean, one of the important things is with the project plans and the project teams, uh, there, there will be an opportunity for people throughout the district to participate in those. And okay. I fully envision when we, for example, when we're looking at the community ones, that, that we'll have other uh, external people in, in that. So I, I don't mean to say we don't want ongoing I feedback. I understand that. But no, the, the, the plan, you voted on the elements. The plan framework is a wrap. And then, okay. you know, as, as we go forward, as always, we welcome feedback from all of our stakeholders. And we'll continue to iterate and improve. And I think this is where this is where the budget conversation really comes into play because you know now that we have I mean if you look through this plan deeply uh, you see we have lots of actions we say we want to do uh, and what we have to do is make sure we budget towards those things because some of these things are aspirational that without without um, you know some of the uh, high level strategies that are identified 
in there. You know, in one example, you know, under um, goal, uh, just, just pulling a, you know, a quick example on the page 20, when he looks at our students, under our students uh, on page 23, um, uh, S3 number 10. Uh, says that we're going to integrate social emotional learning supports into core courses and develop students' social emotional awareness and relationships. Well, you know, there's a there's a resource component to that. So, so as we move into this next phase of work and identifying targets and things, we we have to look at where our where we have the budget and resource to hold ourselves accountable to doing those things, and that's a part of the work. So, you know, the conversation that we'll have with the mayor's offices. How do we, you know, resource helps us accelerate. We're going to move forward regardless, but the, the greater the resource, the faster we can accelerate. So the question becomes how fast can we move? Or how, how fast do we want to move as we, we target this? Because once we have the resource, th that'll be the next big task of the board uh, to help identify what are the priorities we can hold ourselves accountable to and, and how much growth do we expect to make uh, as, we, as we're moving forward. One of the things that we recently did with a, a group of um, uh, staff is we looked at sequencing how the actions, when, when the actions would occur and what their dependencies were. So now that we've got additional language and additional input, we're, we're going back to that work and we're, we're looking at year one, the budget fact sheets pretty really lay out what we would like to do in year one, as well as uh, some some other work that's already underway, and and that work, and then we'll be able to uh, articulate what year two and three would look like. But again, it's gonna it, it may evolve because of budget uh, situations, and each year we'll come back and look at that sequence and make a determination as does that still make sense. But thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you on this, and I'll, uh, and I really thank uh, my team, uh, uh, Mo, Tamara, and the communications team, and, and Lori jumped right in uh, as soon as she <laughs> got here. So, but the, the team has been really great, and, and I appreciate everyone's uh, support. It's great work. It is great work. Thank you, Dr. Carlisle. Okay, also yesterday, uh, we unveiled our, our bold plan to ensure that our students exceed high expectations. One of the foundational elements of our strategic plan is re-envisioning our middle schools. Uh, one of the cornerstones of that plan is expanding student access to hands-on learning opportunities and advanced instruction in STEAM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics. Again, as a former middle school teacher and principal, I can affirm that middle school years are an ideal time to unlock a student's potential and to guide youngsters to high school curriculum pathways that will lead them to higher education pursuits and successful STEAM-related careers. A number of our schools offer STEAM learning opportunities and may have outstanding collaborations underway with STEAM-related partners. Uh, these efforts are going to continue. However, our goal, well, one of the goals of our new strategic plan is to ensure that STEAM is a focus for all of our middle schools. So I'm excited uh, for you to hear the plan that the curriculum and instruction team has crafted to move us forward. And I'm going to ask Dr. Monique Felder, our Chief Academic Officer, to kick off today's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. So Dr. Joseph is excited, <coughs> and I can tell you that we are excited <laughs> too. Um, we are excited because we are finally having an opportunity to uh, speak with you about uh, the great work that will occur through the focus on STEAM in our middle schools. And so you should have a packet that looks like this, a folder. Uh, and in this folder, you will find a STEAM presentation supp supplemental packet. And right on the very front of that packet, are the presenters who are joining me tonight, also known as the STEAM Dream Team. <laughs> All righty then, that's right. And so I'm just gonna introduce them real quick. Come on over, guys. Come, come, all the way over. And so just raise your hand so you can match a name with the face. Uh, Dr. Chris Elliott, Director of STEM. Uh, Dr. Antoinette Williams, Executive Officer, Middle Schools. Uh, Mr. Doug Renfro, Director, Instructional Technology. Uh, Dr. Nola Jones, Coordinator, Performing Arts. Uh, Mrs. Mary Carolyn Marks, she's a fourth grade teacher at Shane Elementary School. 
uh, Ms. Trilony Lane. She's the principal at Cresswell Middle School. And last but not least, me. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, with that, I uh, just want to point out that um, on page one, in, I'm sorry, in page two in your packet, you have our outcomes for tonight. On page three, uh, the STEAM mission and vision. And we'll refer to other pages as we go through our presentation tonight. So, STEAM. In a nutshell, this is what it means. Uh, STEAM is uh, science and arts together. So it is science, technology, engineering, and math plus the arts equals STEAM. And so when we think about that, we ask ourselves, so how are we defining STEAM? And so in a nutshell, it is the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach uh, to learning, where students have the opportunity to think critically, they have the opportunity to problem solve, uh, they have the opportunity to communicate and to collaborate, and uh, together that should uh, support them in their ability to be competitive in the global economy and to be prepared for uh, college in the workforce. So that's how we are defining uh, STEAM. So why STEAM? Well, STEAM supports our strategic goals. And on page 14 in the document that Jana just handed out, it says at the very top in M MPS, we want every school to be a great school. And we believe that uh, STEAM is a vehicle to help our schools become great. Uh, uh, STEAM supports our strategic goals in that uh, it will accelerate academic achievement and student engagement transform teaching and learning. And so it's not just about a curriculum, it's about transforming the pedagogy, uh, teaching skills, how are we going to do that? And it will be through the four Cs. Um, it will ignite uh, inquiry-based and interdisciplinary approach um, to learning. We believe that it will fuel high school readiness and foster community, business, and key stakeholder engagement. And there are other reasons to focus on STEAM. So this slide is from the Euro U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. And as you can see, it is expected between 2010 and 2020 that all occupations uh, will increase, have an increase in job opportunities. Um, but if you look at those orange bars, they indicate that occupations um, that are related to STEAM will grow the most, in fact, by 9 million between 2010 and 2020. So we want our students to be ready for that. Additionally, in a uh, not too distant uh, article that was in the Tennessean, it referenced that right here in Nashville, um, that uh, there are STEM jobs that are hard to fill. And so despite um, offers of a high salary and good benefits. We're experiencing difficulty right here at home in filling STEM jobs. Additionally, I just wanted to mention a few other reasons why we believe we're heading on the right path by focusing on STEAM. We know that music makes us, research supports, um, the correlation between arts education and student success in MNPS. In fact, there was a recent uh, research study uh, that says that um, right here in Nashville, uh, we have the largest concentration of musical professionals in the US and a growing number of sound engineers, designers, and creative artists. Uh, that currently there are 56,000 creative artists right here in Nashville, with many earning incomes across disciplines and employers are actively seeking creativity as they fill these positions right here in Nashville. So, you're next gonna hear about how, exactly how we plan to uh, transform uh, our middle schools through these eight strategies. These are eight new strategies that will be introduced starting next year. Okay. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Transforming MMPS Middle Schools Through STEAM. These are the eight buckets that will help us transform our middle schools. 
One, enhanced pedagogy through STEAM PD. This professional learning will be focused on how teachers teach and students learn. It is the process of learning and not the content of learning that it will be enhanced. Two, computer science for all students. Computer science will be offered to all of our middle schools by the end of year three of the phase in. Three, STEM certification. All middle schools will be certified by the year 2020. A STEAM certification does not exist yet, but it may be one by the year 2020. Four, restoration of honors courses. We already offer coursework for high school credit. In the upcoming school year, we will offer honors ELA in all of our middle schools. In 2018-2019, we will offer honors math, science, and social studies, which will allow for a natural progression from middle school to high school in advanced coursework. This is page six in your packets. Five, de decreased student to computer ratio. Six, 0.5 FTE learning technology specialist. Doug will speak more on this in a few minutes. Seven, STEAM extracurricular activities and summer camps. Our expectation is that every middle school will offer summer camps and utilize their community partners for externships and internships. Eight, contextualized connections to STEAM careers. Critical thinking and creativity will be high and high demand in the year 2020. As such, we are doing our students a disservice if we are not preparing them for these STEAM careers. The best thing we can do for our economy is prepare our students to be competitive. The STEAM pedagogy framework. We know about the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But in order for our students to fully participate in today's global community, students must also master the four C's, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. The best way to help our students master these 21st century skills is to change how we teach and learn in our classrooms. The enhanced STEAM PD and technology piece of our work are the perfect vehicles to focus on this framework, which Doug and Chris will talk more about. Thank you for this opportunity tonight to expand on some of the transformational strategies that we'll be using for STEAM in our schools. I'm going to begin with the collaboration with the IT department to bring additional technology that will be arriving in our schools this summer. This will move our schools from the current three students per one device ratio to two, stu two students to one device ratio for the 17-18 school year. By focusing on laptops in the 17 and 18 school year, all schools will, regardless of the phase of the transformation, benefit from the deployment of technology and also begin a laptop refresh cycle to ensure students are working on current technology. During the 17, 18 school year, a collaborative team comprised of IT, learning technology, teachers and administrators will develop a standard classroom technology package that reflects the tools and skills necessary for a 21st century learner. Many schools already have a variety of technology in their buildings, from interactive whiteboards to maker spaces, and our middle schools are currently using an online social studies textbook, which is in has increased interactivity over traditional textbooks. The STEAM transformation includes a plan to expand the access of interactive and engaging math and science online content. The shift from static to interactivity supports learning through the four C's. By providing a .5 learning technology specialist to each phase one school, teachers will have access to on-site, on-demand professional development and co-teaching opportunities to increase the effective, seamless integration of technology into instruction and the creation of engaging learning environments. Computer science for all. The addition of this instructional content that focuses on problem solving skills increases career opportunities for our students as they move beyond MMPS. There are projected to be 1,400,000 jobs that leverage this skill set in 2020, but only a projected 400,000 degrees will be awarded by that time. 
This program, which focuses on program coding and problem solving, problem solving will be optional in the 17-18 school year. And schools that have a teacher to support this instruction will receive support from the Learning Technology Department and Summer Professional Development. For schools choosing to implement in the 17-18 school year, grades five and six will be the starting point. And all grades, with the additional grades being aided, added in the 18-19 school year. All schools will have computer science for all students at the end of the phase, three year phase in. Lastly, an IDC paper, white paper gathered data on the most requested skills for employment showed that the number three skill employers were looking for was Microsoft Office skills. This skill followed the number one skill of communication and the number two skill of detailed oriented individuals. Imagine Academy provides students the, learning, the opportunity to, ex, to be exposed to individualized learning paths for the ac acquisition of these skills. Students will then have the opportunity at middle school to sit for the Microsoft Office industry certification. This program is also optional in the 17-18 school year, and schools that have a teacher to support instruction will receive support from the Learning Technology Department and our partner in this, Microsoft. For schools choosing to implement, the instruction will begin at the eighth grade in the 17-18 school year. All schools will have this in eighth grade at 18, in the 18-19 school year. This will not only better prepare our students to perform in high school and in internships, but also expose them to industry certifications that they might want to pursue in, in high school. Even if a student chooses not to pursue a job in the STEAM field, these skills are the industry standard and apply to all professions. Good evening. As the coordinator for visual and performing arts, I'm extremely excited about our implementation of STEAM in all of our middle schools. And to Dr. Joseph's point, I find it particularly exciting that all means all. Um, we are, many of you were with us yesterday and you heard Elizabeth Pazarsik's performance of this song yesterday and how powerful and how moving that was for all of us. I think it's very interesting to know that that was a cross-discipline unit and her English class when she wrote that song. So her music class and her English class claimed together and she had wrote that wonderful um, song that impacted all of us. And the purpose of STEAM is to give every child in Metro schools, starting with our middle schools, but to give every child an opportunity to have those rich, creative, powerful experiences across every discipline in every classroom. You've heard a lot of administrators in the district level say a lot of really important things tonight. But I think what can be even more powerful and more informative than that is to have a teacher talk about how she actually uses arts integration in the classroom. So I've asked Caroline Marks, who's one of our outstanding young teachers in Metro schools, she's at Shane Elementary, and I've asked her to come do a brief demonstration of a lesson of what arts integration might be in her classroom. It's important to remember that arts integration is taking music and visual art and theater and dance and inculcating it into the traditional academic classroom. It's, it's a both and, not an either or. So at, at this time, I'd like to ask Caroline Marks to step. I don't think I have a slide, but I brought instructional tools. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello again, my name is Caroline Marks. I'm from Shane Elementary where I teach fourth grade. Um, I interned at an Arts 360 school um, in graduate school, and in the summer of 2015, I attended the Tennessee Arts Academy. Both of these experiences increased my understanding of arts integration in the general ed classroom. So I'm here to talk a little bit about how it can look in action and why it matters to me as an educator. I once taught a lesson called musical math. Did you know that musicians use fractions every day? They are fraction addition masters because music contains measures. Each measure has notes that individually represent a fraction. And when added together, the sum of these notes or fractions equals the time signature of the musical piece. Hence, the musician knows how many beats to award each note per measure. And this creates the rhythm of the music. And you can see here the correlation between the rhythm pyramid and then a basic fraction tree. 
And so the last thing understanding for my students was that adding fractions is the joining of parts to the same whole, even when the denominator is not the same. So through inquiry, my students recognize the endless combinations of rhythms for a measure. For instance, one, two, three, and four, or one, two, three, four, and, and I could go on and on. Um, so this helped them see that there are so many combinations of fractions to a whole too. And so fraction math just became both easy and fun. And so students applied this new knowledge to create their very own musical piece, which they later performed to their peers on the instrument of their choice. And so my question becomes, would you rather add fractions to create your very own musical piece on this, or would you rather learn fractions from a workbook? And I think we all know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> See, leaving out the arts eliminates an entire category of student interest. Arts integration enhances student engagement, promotes real world experiences, and teaches students to think beyond the basis of the curriculum, and it works. It provides a connection, something to attach the learning to, and it keeps the kids com coming running back to the classroom. And so while this lesson was kind of technical in the music integration into a math lesson, there are so many strategies that you can be utilizing every day in any lesson. Trust me, I know I don't even teach math. I actually teach ELA. <laughs> um, and so I use catchy instructional tunes, picture protocols, lyric analysis, and reader's theater, just to name a few. And so I believe that arts have an invaluable place in our schools, both as their own courses, that's important too, but then also in the general ed classroom. Thank you. Awesome. Now you know why her principal calls her Miss Bubbly. And I think we would all agree that we would love to attend a class like that every day. It, it, it's important that we realize one of, our, one of our goals in this strategy will be to educate all teachers to inculcate this into their classrooms. And that's that very first piece that, that Dr. Williams talked about with regard to the, um, the PD that will be so critical to this process. But we believe that when we get teachers like Caroline who are invested and who have buy-in, um, all will mean all, and every child can have a great opportunity to learn through the arts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Jones and Ms. Marks. So as our district transitions from a STEM district to a STEAM district, we wanted to point out the strong foundation in existing programs that are well underway that will be a solid foundation as we add the transformation for our middle schools. So I'd like to reference the document in your packet that um, is a diagram. It's titled MNPS STEM, as it was formerly known, and really outlining the programs that are underway, um, bringing the arts, sciences, math, technology, engineering to our students currently. The first thing that I would point out is the Vanderbilt programs that we have in, that are existing in our schools. The first one is our ISR, Interdisciplinary Research Program. That program currently exists at Stratford High School, Overton, which was just added this year, Hunter's Lane, and Hillsboro. Those are programs that engage students in very high level scientific research that um, at many times yields into scientific journals. So really a phenomenal job in those programs is being done by those scientists. We also have two programs, one called the Resident Scientist and one called the Scientist in the Classroom. And those are programs where we actually have embedded Vanderbilt scientists, either full-time or part-time, in many of our schools. And so you can see a number of elementary schools and middle schools where we have those scientists working with teachers side by side, making sure they're that students are engaged in uh, STEM projects, STEAM projects um, in their schools. The final one to mention there is Day of Discovery, and that's an opportunity where we get younger students involved in programs similar to ISR. We bring those students to either uh, their high school, uh, their feeder high school, or um, Vanderbilt University itself, and engage them in ISR-type research to really get them geared up for um, interdisciplinary science and research when they move to the high school level. 
Two other things to mention as you look at this graph and this chart. Um, we have an existing program that you're probably aware of, hopefully you've heard of, our I-3 federal grant that allows us to bring after-school programming to seven of our middle schools. That program is wrapping up its first year and has had phenomenal success in terms of engaging students. Um, many of our schools are full at capacity with waiting lists and we continue to engage more students and parents as the program moves forward and we have many years yet to continue to improve. And so we learn things from that program as it's designed to that hopefully we can implement in our, um, the rest of our middle schools as we transition. And finally, one of the reasons for the transformation of our middle schools is that we want to better prepare our students for success in high school. And you could argue that every one of our 41 academies is related in some way to STEAM. And so we're better preparing students by engaging them earlier, and as the research tells us, engaging students in these types of activities in earlier age increases their self-efficacy and their persistence in these types of in endeavors. And so we're really excited about bringing this to the middle school level. We are a large district, as you probably are well aware, and we don't have to say that, but this causes us to approach this very purposefully, and we're going to do a phase-in process. And so for year one, we are phasing in, beginning with 18 of the middle schools. The question that might come to mind is, okay, there are more than 18 middle schools, how did we decide? And so you'll see that a number of the middle schools are highlighted in color, and those were sort of easy choices for us because those were schools already engaged in some way in some sort of STEM work. And so those schools really stepped right up to the plate. Um, they already had been in process and transition due to some other programs, and so they were uh, easily identified. The remainder of the schools were chosen through uh, Two, two ways, two methods. One was we asked all middle schools to fill out a survey, which is included uh, in your packet. That survey really helped us capture where they were in terms of being ready to transform to STEAM, but also their, their um, capacity, um, they, if they had a strategic plan to maybe approach or tackle it, um, what resources they had available. And we really asked them, one of the most important questions is we asked them, are you ready to go in the fall? And some of them were honest and told us no, but we really would appreciate you helping get us ready for phase two. And so the important point is that um, that survey, along with trying to ensure um, that, that we were equitable in, in selecting across our district was how those schools were chosen. So do all, are, are, does that represent all nine board districts in terms of schools selected in the first yes. phase? Yes, it does. Just barely, I might add, just barely. <laughs> <laughs> so here's some other good news. Uh, as a principal that maybe is not on that list, one of the questions would be, what are my students getting? Because all of this work is about students and ensuring their success. All middle schools, whether they are phase one or phase two, will be getting a number of resources. If they have a computer teacher, they will be able to participate in the computer science curriculum and the training during the summer. They also will be able to participate in a number of the professional development opportunities that are being provided to phase one schools. Um, it's just really the first year about where we're going to be purposeful and focused given um, we want to focus our resources and be effective in year one. The other key piece is that we will be providing professional development targeted to phase two schools during phase one to make sure that they're ready for the second year, which will take place the following school year. So here's the timeline, what it will look like roughly and, and next steps. So the phase one schools have already been announced as you just saw. Um, we will take place uh, what students will see, the difference will happen when they walk into the doors of their schools beginning in the fall. Phase two schools will start in the fall of 2018. We also have an RFP process that is out. We are very near to making a final selection to add that digital content and professional development and really help us um, with capacity to change all of those 18 schools within one school year. And so we will be announcing who that is very soon and that will help us with really making sure we are effective right out of the gates in year one. We've also announced the summer PD dates for the computer science training as you heard Doug talk about. Those are on the books and we're ready to go for those. We have a STEAM Advisory Council that will be launched. Its first meeting will take place next week, April 20th. We're very, very excited about the partnerships that we have already established with the business community, uh, nonprofits, um, 
the Nashville um, Chamber of Commerce has been amazing. They've helped connect us with business and industry. They even set up a trip for us to visit uh, Clarksville Montgomery Schools, who is a few years ahead of us in this transformation process. So um, the, the business and industry and community leaders have been extremely supportive, and we are gonna continue to look to them to make sure that their voice is heard and that they um, can really help guide the implementation process and help us evaluate our success as we move forward. We have a STEAM launch event. We should celebrate anything great. Anything great that we undertake deserves celebration. And so we will be planning a major event, more information to come on August 1st at one of these schools to really kick off this really exciting initiative. And finally, we have a sustainability plan. So obviously this is going to require some resources. Dr. Joseph talked about prioritizing resources. The prioritization is very heavy at the onset because we are changing the way our schools operate. And so it requires a significant effort. But we're ensuring that once that change takes place, at the end of the three-year phase-in plan, that we have the internal capacity to maintain the work that we've done. We're being very purposeful about that, so rest assured we'll be very efficient. We also want to make sure that we evaluate. Everything that we engage in requires accountability, both because we're spending taxpayers' dollars, but most importantly because student success is our number one goal, and we have to make sure that we're doing that. And so we are going to monitor student achievement in our student test scores. We're going to evaluate changes in student self-efficacy in science and math. That is so important at this age group in the middle schools that they feel confident as if that they have a future in, in these types of careers and that they have the capacity to do this work. So we're gonna make sure we track that. We're gonna evaluate student awareness and interest in STEAM careers. We wanna make sure that they're interested in these career opportunities and that they're aware, that's really the beginning. We wanna look at our teachers. We wanna look at their self-efficacy in order to be able to teach some of this content and subject area, it's very important that they feel confident. So we're gonna help them uh, feel confident and give them the professional development that they need to get there. We wanna look longitudinally. When we do this work in the middle school, we want to follow these students and see where they go at the high school level. We want to see where they go beyond high school and see if they're actually entering these careers and if they're successful. So this is a long undertaking. We're very well invested in it. We want to ensure that we're successful. We also wanna look at students' engagement in their after-school programs. Um, as I mentioned before, we have tremendous success in our I-3 program. We've learned a lot and we know what to do well. We also know what not to do, and so we wanna track and make sure that every student feels welcome and that every student is taking or has the ability to participate in these out-of-school activities because they are so important to really reinforce what's happening within the classroom. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. I became the principal of IT Crestwell the end of July, three days before the teachers arrived. Mm -hmm. And so I walked the building and got familiar, uh, figured out where the lights were, <laughs> and the, you know, air and all those kinds of things. And so fast forward to August in the gym with over 100 eighth graders, and I decided I wanted to talk to them. And so I decided I would do that without a microphone. And so here comes this little eighth grade boy, didn't know his name, and he said, you want some sound? You want a mic? And I said, yeah, but in my mind I thought, you don't know what you're doing, you're about to mess up everything, right? Like fast forward about two minutes, and I have a mic and sound. This young man will be leaving us this year, and I don't know what we will do without him. <laughs> so let's move forward to finding out that Dr. Joseph is coming to our school to do his <laughs> state of the district. I'm panic. I'm excited, and the gentlemen come through, you know, all these people that understand lights and sound, and they're working, and here comes this little eighth grader, and he's helping them. And we go to spring break, and I'm walking with the gentleman, and one of them say, uh, you know that boy, we're gonna need him. We'll make sure he's here. And I'm thinking he's only like 13, 14. And last week, I go back to school for sound checks and lights, and there's that student running around, working on sound, working on light, behind the scene, learning different things. And I hear one of the gentlemen say, I wish I could hire him now. He will leave us this year and head on to NSA and I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> because he literally is our sound and light for everything that we do at IT Cresswell. What I'm telling you is that this work really matters. You have a 14-year-old student 
who, if he were just of age, would have a job right now today. Our students can do so much if only given the opportunity to try. As educators, I believe that our role and our job is to make sure that we are opening the windows to the world. What better way to do that than to do it through STEAM? My students were able to learn so much in just a few days as we prepared for Dr. Joseph's visit. We learned about the teleprompter. We learned how to roll the cords correctly. I didn't think that mattered. I, I did too. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you just bunched it up and it really didn't matter, but there's a technique behind that. That was hands-on learning, learning that doesn't happen in a textbook. What I'm saying is that our students deserve the opportunity to learn through STEAM. I remember when I graduated from Tennessee State University, we had uh, the engineers. And when they said the Department of Engineering, they pulled out money and they started waving it in the air mm -hmm. because they realized at the young age of 21, they could be making $56,000 to $101,000. You see, I always knew I wanted to be an educator, but not everyone knows what they want to do. So I enjoyed school because going to school for me was a hands-on learning activity. But what if you want to be a scientist? What if you want to work in technology or engineering or mathematics, and you can only do it for one hour a day? School might not be as fun. So if we can bring STEAM into school, we can get more students on board, more students that are excited and passionate about school. Our students will realize that even though they're young, they can make a difference. I am so excited, I am so lucky that I was able to attend the, um, the visit that we made to Pensacola to learn about STEAM, and I am looking forward to letting our students realize that the sky's the limit, and I am very thrilled to let Crestwell be one of the schools where students get to learn and grow. Thank you. Can you tell us a little more about the Pensacola uh, trip? What, what did you see? Yes. So we visited the Santa Fe School District. And uh, I believe those schools were two to three years into this initiative. And we got to see students that were hands-on. They were excited. You could ask any student in any classroom, what are you doing? What are you working on? And how and why is this important? And they can connect everything back to standards. You saw teachers that were excited and thrilled and they felt empowered because they were able to make a difference and bring creativity in the classroom. We saw administrators that were proud of the learning environment that they've created where they have empowered students and they've empowered teachers and they've also empowered families. You saw families that were proud to have their students in school because they realized that their students were making a difference now at the age of 14 and younger. Um, it was just really exciting. We saw great partnerships with the community and as Dr. Joseph said yesterday, Yesterday, uh, the Nashville community is ripe for building and growing and working together. And so the, the relationships and the connections that I saw in Santa Fe, Nashville's ready for this. And it's going to be very exciting, and I cannot wait to be a part of that. Um, and it's just going to be wonderful to begin to let our students grow and learn together. Thank you. So before we open the floor up for discussion and questions, we have a short video clip that we'd like to share with you. And it exemplifies what we saw in Santa Ana, as well as what we want to see in every classroom every day. Questions? 
Anybody have any questions? I just want to thank each and every one of you for uh, the presentation tonight. I know Dr. Jones knows this about me and, and Lori in the back. Um, Lori Shell knows this about me. There's probably not a bigger advocate for arts in the, in the school than, than I have been. Um, our, our children got to take advantage of it, and they were some of the lucky ones. Not everybody is that lucky. And so I am so excited about this. It's just amazing. I love the honors classes in middle school. I mean, we, it's just, there are so many, um, there's so many components of it. I, I, you know, I can't even enumerate them all. But what I would request is that we have a work session around the work once school starts. Because I think that we would like to see the actual, you know, application because it's such a big change for us. I mean, we have never had a change agent in middle schools like this ever. And, and, and you know, we know, we know that's where we're losing a lot of our children is in the middle schools. And if we can make, exci make it exciting like this, oh, my gosh, we'll have to build more schools. And that would be a good thing. <laughs> that would be a good thing. Anybody else have any? Just have a comment, okay. too. Um, Dr. Felder, when we went to um, Atlanta to see the Ron Clark Academy, this reminds me of that. Would you agree that it's that type of enthusiastic learning? Um, yes. Oh, very much so. Uh, what we saw at the Ron Clark Academy um, was what we want to see in every classroom in Metro Nashville Public Schools, and that is uh, children were collaborating. Uh, regardless of the content uh, area or discipline, uh, children were thinking critically, um, and that was prompted by uh, teachers in terms of the lessons they planned, the questions that they posed, uh, the activities that they provided for their students. Um, we saw students um, just being extremely creative, beyond creative. Not, even the, not only the students were creative, but the teachers were as well. And so we saw the four C's in action. Uh, at the Ron Clark Academy. And um, we saw it in Santa Ana. Uh, the team that visited Clarksville, Montgomery yesterday saw it there. So as it said on this uh, one of the slides, sometimes you have to see it in order to be able to do it. We saw it, and we will do it. Sounds great. And maybe people from all over the country will be coming to Nashville, Tennessee to see our middle schools. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> thank you anybody else comments questions Ms. Pierce? Yeah, uh, I won't take long um, thank you so much I know the, the having the honors classes back at middle school will be huge I know parents in my district have been um, really missing those um, I did have one question that will be more uh, when we have our work session just wanting to make sure um, that parents understand or and that we understand how much if any of those honors courses and in, in, in individualized work will be done online versus having a teacher. So I just, I'm hoping that those resources are there, that we will be having honors classes taught by teachers and not all of it, or the majority of it done on, online. Just, just as a question. Anybody else? Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. It's I fine. just want to shout out Dr. Jones. She was my band teacher in seventh grade. <laughs> I could not carry a tune in a bucket, so she actually, <laughs> that's what drove me back into dance, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. All right, we will move on to committee reports. Um, the first one is class, Ms. Pro. So I do have a few updates to the report that I gave a few weeks ago. Um, first, the A through F grading system for school districts. House Bill 449, Senate Bill 536 by Forgety and Tracy would have amended a law that's set to go, go into effect next year that requires the department to, design, to assign each school district an A through F letter grade. This bill died in the Senate. And, however, we do hope that the legislature may still find another way to address this problematic new law, particularly because several other states are considering repealing the law elsewhere. Uh, second, vouchers. House Bill 126, Senate Bill 161 by Brooks and Kelsey, which is the Opportunity Scholarship Pilot Program uh, that applies only to Shelby County, uh, Shelby County is, uh, has been stuck in the House government operations. 
Uh, third, charter schools, uh, House Bill 310, Senate Bill 1197 by Brooks and Norris is in the House Finance this is in House Finance this week, and it allows school districts to charge an authorizer fee for charter schools, but also requires districts to provide a, a student contact information to charter schools for marketing purposes. Here in Nashville, one charter school chain turned over private and personal student information to a third party, out-of-state vendor that generated spam text to parents for purposes of recruitment. Sending unsolicited text messages is a violation of federal law, and now parents at that school um, have filed a class action lawsuit uh, because they are upset by the mass marketing text. So the sharing of personal student information is something we should remain concerned about. Um, and the fact that this bill would require districts to disclose this type of information to charter vendors is problematic. Um, and then finally today, a bill fell, failed that would have allowed undocumented immigrants who graduate from a Tennessee high school and who have lived here at least two years to pay in-state in tuition to Tennessee universities. And that bill is House Bill 863, Senate Bill 1014 by White and Gardenhire. And that concludes my report. And it fell by one vote. One vote. <laughs> I said. Yeah. Um, capital needs. Miss. <coughs> um, Jen, Dr. Jen, is not here. Okay, we'll move on to budget and finance. <coughs> yes, uh, thank you. Excuse me. Um. <coughs> uh, we had our budget meeting this afternoon, and we talked about an overview of our three-year budget, and uh, then we passed our budget and passed it on the on the, the floor. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to say anything about the? Oh yes, thank you. Uh, there has uh, we we are going to need to um, change our uh, pub, our uh, budget hearing that's scheduled for Thursday at nine o'clock. Uh, and I is that tentative the tentative date or is that? I think it's it's confirmed that everyone. So we will meet instead. Um, on Monday, <coughs> the 17th, at 8 o'clock. 8 a.m. 8 a.m., yes, with all the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I have a comment that I would like to make um, regarding budgets um, and also under the committees. Um, on the last board meeting that was had, that we had, I had to leave early to go to a parent meeting, to attend a parent meeting at Antioch High School, and MNEA and NOAA came in to speak, and I think their concern was regarding me and a subcommittee that um, should have been, or that they thought was formed through our board. It was my understanding that, our, that at our last board retreat, we decided to I guess not have a subcommittee um, or that the subcommittee had never been formed. Um, and our board chair, Anna Shepard, was supposed to have sent a letter to NOAA as well as to the PAC. However, they, as far, after speaking with Anna today, that letter had not been sent out. And I just wanted to confirm with this board that that was our agreement and to also just get an understanding and just be transparent to um, anyone that has concerns about me not wanting to or not supporting NOAA's efforts to decrease um, the, the prison to, from school to prison pipeline that is occurring in our schools because I would never be against those efforts and I also would like to read an email that I sent responding to NOAA and their request for that subcommittee but I first need to understand with our board here those eight of us that are sitting here today the understanding that we had regard after we left that um, board retreat as it relates to what we were going to do with um, NOAA and the PAC. Can I have a comment, Mike? <clears throat> yeah, so I um, actually left uh, a little while ago and went over to NOAA at their request um, to answer to the commitments that uh, I made last year uh, and that several of us made last year. And, and while, you, while you guys were talking about the strategic plan, I was assuring them that S3 uh, number 
three uh, in the strategic plan says monitor the revision, um, excuse me, uh, S34, monitor the implementation of restorative practices. So, so I just kind of went to tell them, like, look, I re remain committed to the commitments that I made last year when I was running, and I imagine, you know, others who make commitments are, remain committed as well. You know, by the way, you know, we're baking this work into um, the strategic plan, and, and so thanks very much, and we'll be back in touch. So again, I was there at their request and then turned around and came right back here. But you know, whether it's, it's an ongoing committee or whether it's just a matter of us getting around the table and figuring out how to kind of revisit the commitments that several, I think, you know, eight, if not all of us made, um, and how to bake that into the, explicitly into the work going forward, I think that's really all they're looking for would be my guess. And, and they, I, they, pardon me. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I thought you were finished. I'm sorry. Um, I th all along, we had continued to encourage Noah to work with us through our efforts with passage. And so um, many of those members have attended those meetings, and they know um, the plan for uh, decreasing the number of suspensions and expulsions. And so we are still encouraging them to work with us through our own department of student services and passage. Now, I know I, um, Dr. Carla and I met with the uh, board of NOAA, and they had asked um, our work, and we communicated the same thing that um, Ms. Brandon had shared, Dr. Brandon had shared that. We knew that work was happening with passage at this moment. Um, they specifically requested, you know, could we meet with them in addition to passage? And we said, uh, you know, ideally we'd like to keep that work in one in one bucket we, because then you know we'd have a lot of requests from lots of different individuals on the same thing. So how can we, if we have a, a venue, particularly the Oasis and the passage work that is focused on the the student to prison pipeline and representatives are there. Couldn't it be solved at that at that issue? And, and uh, Dr. Carla, what, what did we we had next steps um, off the top of my head? I don't remember. I have a meeting coming up. With what they were. Reverend Saunders and, and then. So I have a meeting, a follow up meeting coming up, and and also I've met twice with the PAC, uh, once with Ms. Shepard, and then since then, uh, uh, twice afterwards. This, uh, just having been kind of in and around the conversation now for more than a year, th this kind of where we're at now feels kind of like one of those classic, you know, just communications breakdowns. And I think like nine out of ten problems are communications problems. That's a professional and personal bias. And I think as long as we're just keeping them engaged and fulfilling the commitments or working toward fulfilling the commitments that we made, I, I think everybody's fine. And I'm happy to meet with them if, um, when, when you meet with them too as well. And just you know, be, clear, be transparent, and clarify with them what, where we are and where we'd like, how we'd like to work with them. So, I think there's more than a communication problem, because we, as a board, nine members on the board, made a decision at our last retreat, and the communications problem is happening with us because we did we weren't aware. Of, you're more than welcome to, to attend a meeting, but we, as a board made an agreement and we, we are, we're doing well, we're really working well together, but this is where we begin to have our communication breakdowns when things are happening that we're not aware of and it appears that I'm the lone board member not willing to stand behind you know, th the things that they're doing. Um, Gideon's Army has also approached us to work with them. The PAC is also approaching us to work with them. Um, I, I'm, I just feel compelled to read the email that I sent to Mrs. Sanders on January the 1st because I don't want anyone, to, it's really misleading um, when they came up and spoke um, and it makes it seem as if I'm not supportive. I'm extremely supportive. In fact, I was the only board member that went to their meeting that they held um, in right after we left Utah. So here's my email. Good afternoon. I'm assuming you're referring to me, and this is, was, was her asking about the subcommittee that they felt like I was appointed to. And I said, I've, re I've reached out to you and plan to have a conversation with you regarding my position as chair of community engagement. I was also the only school board member to attend NOAA's most recent community meeting 
as my colleagues and I were just returning from a retreat. On the other hand, I'm not on your subcommittee on school discipline and disparities. Therefore, if there was any agreement made, I was not a part of that decision. Otherwise, I would have upheld my commitment. We have been extremely busy. Yes, it has been difficult to schedule additional meetings with your organization as well as many others. A part of the work that we've been engaged in is in, I can't remember, I can't read that part. It was my initial recommendation over a year ago that Noah collaborate with Dr. Tony Majors and the work that he does in this area. I, at the time, voiced my concerns for additional committee focusing on this, committees focusing on the same work, especially because of the time commitments for different meetings, financial needs, and lack of an ability to, tru to truly focus on solutions and direction. I also referenced Gideon's Army and the work that they do to address this problem. In my opinion, if there is true collaboration, there are places to begin. Our job on the school board is to set policy, policies around these efforts, determine and approve financial resources that may be necessary to assist in meeting obligations and offering the necessary support to our director of schools. What are your needs? I am happy to address them. We are very aware of the concerns. We are working diligently to improve these outcomes. Do you have any recommendations and or evidence-based practices to share to assist us in eliminating this disparity? As we both know, we can all come together time after time to discuss the problems. On a separate note, I am more than happy to discuss with you serving on the subcommittee. However, this would be separate from, a, from an MMPS board appointment. As of now, we don't have a specific appointment in that capacity. In fact, we have worked to eliminate many of our subcommittees. There are many agencies who are doing great work across the district. We sincerely appreciate yours and their passion and dedication. It is always a blessing to see people serving in their purpose. Unfortunately, we cannot commit to all of you. Yet and still, we are extremely Eternally grateful to eternally grateful to you. Thank you for all that you do. Teamwork sincerely makes the dream work. Happy New Year to each of you. However, with all of that being said, I would like to make a motion that we appoint that we form a subcommittee and that we appoint someone from the board to work with both Noah <coughs> and Gideon's Army. I think we need to have a discussion about that in our governance committee meeting before we. Um Entertain a motion or a vote. Let's do that. There's no second. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So we, I would like to bring that motion after we have that discussion because that is what they're asking. That is their ask. And I also reiterated to them several times the what the same sentiment that you just sent in your email. Well, my my biggest concern was that we agreed at the meeting that you would send a, a letter to them saying that there is no subcommittee. And that's, I think if that letter had gone out. I did send an email. It may not have been a formal letter, but it was an email on more than one occasion. Okay. So, I mean, Ms. Hunter, I'll support whatever direction you want to go uh, in the conversation later. But, you know, when I went, tonight just to speak to them you know, only on, that, on behalf of myself, you know, what they were basically asking is, are you still committed to the commitments you made last year? And I said, of course. And and then I asked them to, will you resend those to me? <laughs> because I don't have I them have handy. them. Let me read, let then, me read them to then, you. But, but, but they're going to they're gonna send them to me, and then I'm going to, or if you want to share them with, with everybody else. And I think it's just a matter of us socializing the commitments that we made to them before Dr. Joseph got here with Dr. Joseph and his team. And so if you're, if you're agreeing to that, here's what their public meeting program outlined. Wait, 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 wait. Before you go there, let's go ahead and discuss that in, in governance committee meeting. Well, the, a problem with that is transparency. Well, and our committee meetings are open to the public. Okay, why can we not discuss that now? I, I need to know why we can't have this discussion now because he just said he agreed to something and I think here is what he's agreeing to and we're having the discussion now. Why do we have to taper it for later when we're talking about it now? Well, we're talking about it now kind of out of turn. It's really not on the agenda. So I would prefer to have that discussion in a committee meeting. I would prefer to have it now, but if everyone else disagrees, then that's fine. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll table it and have it in discussion in a committee meeting. Ms. Rogue, if you've taken note for that, I would appreciate it. And so we're going to move along with the agenda. And so the, next on the, uh, is the board chair report. So I've combined my announcements and board chair report tonight. So. Um, uh, in the midst of much negativity and uncertainty, I took a deep breath last week and was pleasantly surprised to see that MMPS is surrounded in excellence. 
Last Thursday morning, the McGavitt Cluster Coalition held its first fundraising breakfast. We had around 150 in attendance, including student ambassadors, students performing in the string ensemble, and students performing in the inner choral program at McGavick High School. It was a beautiful event, and I want to thank Dr. Um, Cedar Narcisse for being there to witness this beauty. Then last Thursday evening, the McGavick Wind Ensemble performed at the Opryland Hotel as part of the Tennessee Music Educators Association Conference. This was the first time in a number of years that this group has been invited to perform for TMEA. They performed six pieces of excellence. They were outstanding. That performance brought back very many memories, especially when the guest conductor, um, Jeff Beckman, um, conducted a piece. He was our, our son's band director when, they, when he was still at the school and they were still at the school. And I wanted to thank Dr. Monique Felder for being there for that. Uh, CMA is honoring our excellent music education, uh, educators with a reception and dinner for them later this month at Nissan Stadium. The two band directors at McGavick High School, John David Hazlett and John Wilmack, will be two of those excellent music educa educators who will be recognized. On May 2nd, we will recognize and honor all the Metro Nashville Public School Teachers of the Year at a celebration to recognize their contributions for our students. At our last board meeting, we heard from Dr. Bob Fisher, president of Belmont University, and Dr. Michael Steele from Stratford High School about the Bridges to Belmont program. And we needed tissues for that. This May, we will see the first cohort of this program graduate what a wonderful opportunity for these students who probably would never have had that. So please just take a moment just to look at all the beautiful things that are happening in and around our schools. It's not all gloom and doom and negativity. There are some beautiful, wonderful things happening. So that concludes my board chair report. We'll start with announcements. Ms. Bugs? I got nothing. You got nothing. Oh, okay. You know what? I do know that the testing window will be opening soon. So. All those students preparing tests, all those counselors counting tests, and all those teachers ready for tests, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Pierce. Okay, yes, um, Julia <clears throat> Green had a chess team of five boys that participated in the state chess championship on March 25th, and they placed fifth in the primary division. So we want to congratulate Sawyer Stein, William Zong, Henry and Houston Hurt, and Eli Kramer. Um, and then also, I don't know the other half of the clusters, but the Mayor's Art Show at the Frest that uh, Hillsborough Cluster is in is Antioch, Cane Ridge, Glencliff, Hillsborough, Hunters Lane, Pearl Cone, and Stratford, and that will be at the Frist on Thursday, April 27th from 5 to 7 with remarks at 6 o'clock. And that art show will run through May 11th if you can't make it on the 27th, and I hope somebody has the other date for the other half of the clusters because I just don't have it in this email. They've, they've split us up. Yeah, they, they didn't. That's, they didn't? That's it? That's it? Mm -hmm. no, and there's another one. There's Maplewood and... Stri uh, yeah, there's, there's another, another one. one? Okay, um, that's the only email that I, I only got. wrote that one okay. down also. So anyway, right. but um, that's exciting. And then um, also maybe we can work with Dr. Severe on how we do add items of potential new business. And then I want to say a personal thank you to Jill for her leadership with the budget. It's been really fun. Jill is really fun to work with. So I appreciate um, her including me so much in these meetings. So. Oh, the luncheon. Oh, my word. So um, <laughs> a week from to today, to we are having the employee luncheon that honors the employees who have worked 30 or 40 years in the district. And we even have one who's worked 45 years. So that'll be a week from today, April 18th at Martin. Um, from 11.30 to 1, and I know we have a string ensemble from MLK or a, an ensemble from MLK going to perform, and uh, we will have some student artwork, and Copper Kettle is catering again, so we hope that um, all the board can come, and uh, congratulations and big thanks to all those employees who will be honored. Thank you. Ms. Hunter. On a lighter note, <laughs> <laughs> Antioch High School has invited me to their prom. <laughs> and prom? <laughs> April 22nd, Antioch High School is having prom. I'm going to go. They've invited me. And um, Cane Ridge is April 28th. My son is going to that one, and I'm going to see if they can invite me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, after Dr. Joseph's wonderful morning yesterday, uh, at Cresswell, uh, I was able to visit the Literacy Partnership 
at Martin. And um, the, our literacy partnership is uh, an elementary uh, program for classroom teachers. It's our, we call it the literacy, uh, the Lipscomb Literacy Partnership. It's really based on um, Literacy Collaborative, which is out of the Ohio State University. But it was written by Tammy Lipsy and Dr. Uh, Candace McQueen. And we've been doing this for three years. So I got to hear uh, Dr. Lipsy and Melanie Maxwell present, and it was really phenomenal. Do y'all got, you guys remember when we went to uh, New Orleans and we, we, we were supposed to read an article and we were all nervous about it and we had that article all um, you know, underlined and highlighted. The teachers came in like that. They had this article highlighted. They were talking to each other on the way, you know, at, at, at their tables about it. Questions were posed and uh, the teachers cited the answers to the questions by looking at the page number and the paragraph, so I, it was, they were well prepared for this. And I, I was only there for two hours, but I was very impressed. I think it was an all-day event. Um, uh, I wanted to share also that uh, they, they had videos that, uh, and demonstrations of, of different teaching techniques. Um, they used expository of text and fiction. Um, so it was, it, it was, it was really um, a, a well-rounded presentation. Uh, Education Day is, I guess it's next week, April 20th, uh, and I'm going to be able to speak at uh, Leadership Goodless Full with Cito Narcisse, and then uh, we will celebrate our District 3 schools at the Madison Goodless Full Chamber of Commerce luncheon. The Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce will celebrate our high school academies of Nashville on April 24th from 4.30 <coughs> to 7.30, and they will announce this year's uh, winners. Uh, and that concludes my announcements. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, want to say congratulations to Dr. Joseph on your first State of Schools address. It was um, it was a really great day yesterday, and uh, you know, we've talked in our retreats about B3, building a better board. I was watching you, and I thought, man, that's C3. That's calm, cool, collective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we need right now, so thank you. Um, and then just to... Um, uh, follow up uh, something Ms. Hunter mentioned earlier in the in the meeting. I want to congratulate um, former school board member and council lady Karen Johnson uh, for another successful Southeast Easter event. It's kind of turned into really my favorite event of the year. And uh, also to my friend uh, Alma Sanford, former count, uh, former school board member Lorinda Hale, and all the others who were involved to do such great work putting that together for our kids uh, every year. I saw, uh, got to be on stage with Dr. Joseph uh, and got video of him dancing with the mayor, so that was good. And uh, the one thing Councilman Bob Mendez, I think, uh, you know, rightfully observed was uh, the politicians need to get off the stage because we can't compete with the Easter Bunny, Spider-Man, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So, so it, was a, it was a great day and the, and the weather was great to boot. So congratulations, Council Lady Johnson. I have a few. Um, first of all, I will say that the Hillwood Cluster Schools all rocked their Mid-State Instrumental Performance at the Mid-State um, at the Mid-State Concert Performance Assessment. All of the ensembles from Hillwood that participated received superior ratings and sight reading, and. Uh, in prepared music, the H.G. Hill Honor Band was rated as excellent, and that's my daughter's band, woohoo. Um, the Bellevue Symphonic Band, the Bellevue Symphony Orchestra, the Hillwood Symphonic Band, and Hillwood Strings all received su superior ratings, so they did an excellent job this year. A um, couple of uh, announcements about events coming up in my district. Um, Gower Elementary School is going to be hosting its um, Gator Gallop on April 21st. It's a school fundraiser where the kids run laps for donations. Uh, Charlotte Park Elementary has a couple of events coming up. They have a kindergarten performance on the 13th and a multi multicultural family night on the 28th of this month. And uh, we have some sad news in my district because our beloved Connie Gwynn, uh, who's principal of H.G. Hill, has announced her retirement this year. And uh, so we are beginning the process of uh, looking for a, a new principal. And there will be an H.G. Hill community meeting this coming Thursday night uh, on the 20th of April at 6 p.m. Uh, for anyone who'd like to participate. And finally, um, 
I would like to announce that I am going to be part of a movie at Regal uh, 27 <laughs> this um, this month. I, a couple, few years ago, I participated in a um, documentary called Backpack Full of Cash. Um, it profiles school reform efforts in New Orleans, Nashville, Philadelphia, and other cities. Um, and that the movie that was selected as a uh, part of the Nashville Film Festival this year. And so uh, my children and their teachers and several other people, I haven't actually seen the movie, but several other people in Nashville are going to be in the movie. Uh, tickets are going to go on sale tomorrow. And so if you'd like to, to go, uh, I'll put it out on social media, the link. Um, it will be premiered on on Sunday, April 23rd at 5.30 p.m. and on Tuesday, April 25th at 5.30 p.m. Um, and so if I would really love for everyone to come and, and watch the movie uh, with me, um, and you can come see me and my, my new friend, Matt Damon, <laughs> 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 who I didn't actually meet. <laughs> so anyway. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I have no announcements. <laughs> <laughs> Be there, no further business. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>